Good evening and welcome to the select board meeting of February 26th, 2018. I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.30 on the nose. We're on time. Excellent. Um, we'll start with an opening remarks, announcement, and agenda review. Um, is there anything that anyone needs or wants to add to the, uh, the agenda as it currently is? I'll talk about the order of events in just a moment, but I'm not seeing anything that needed any, any change. Um, is anyone here for public comment other than something that's on our agenda? And if not, then you guys are both here for things that are on our agenda. So um, since we don't have folks for public comment, we'll move into our agenda. I believe what we'll do is we'll, we have a couple of folks here for some resolutions that we have on our, our, uh, our agenda tonight under section six of our, of our agenda. Uh, and so we'll take those up first just to um, get those going and, and, and take care of those. And so um, first on our agenda for the resolutions and proclamation is the proclamation 2018 Tibet Day for th uh, March 10th, 2018, which is coming up soon. Um, find the right group of things here. So if you want to sure. come forward, to, and if you just want to introduce it to us a little bit, and, and uh, just introduce yourself uh, on the microphone so the folks at home can can uh, know who you are and tell us a little bit about it, and then we'll do the actual business part. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Thondup Tsering and uh, I am a Amherst resident for the last 20 years, uh, part of the local Tibetan community. Um, my name is Tenzin Tsang. I am currently a sophomore at UMass Amherst. Uh, and I'm also president of UMass SFT. And SFT stands for Students for Free Tibet. Um, so this year, March 10th, is the 59th anniversary of the Tibetan National Uprising Day, and throughout the world, Tibetans and Tibet supporters will be organizing different e events to sort of mark this day and to remember the uh, folks who had sacrificed their life and also to express our solidarity with Tibetans inside Tibet. Um, we have submitted before the select board uh, a proclamation request, so I'm not gonna go into the details, uh, but I wanna just highlight a few uh, of the um, requests that we have made to the select board. Uh, this request is based on uh, a bipartisan resolution that is at the state level, which is uh, state Senate, sorry, Senate Resolution 480, uh, and a similar resolution even at the Congress as well. Um, so we are requesting the town of Amherst to recognize March 10th as a Tibetan Rights Day and to fly the Tibetan national flag um, for 59 days till May 7, because it's the 59th anniversary of the Tibetan National Uprising Day. Um, we are requesting um, the uh, town of Amherst to support the Tibetan people's fundamental human rights and freedom, including their right to self-determination and the protection of their distinct religious, cultural, linguistic, and national identity. Um, another request that we have before you is to express the um, Tamra Amos sense that the identification and the, ins and the installation of Tibetan Buddhist religious leader, including the future 15 Dalai Lama, is a matter that should be determined solely within the Tibetan Buddhist community in accordance to our Buddhist right and our freedom. Um, China, which claims uh, to not believe in their religion, um, have passed certain regulations uh, saying that they are going to be the ones who will have a role and final say in who the next Dalai Lama is going to be, which is totally unacceptable. Um, similarly, the, our request number eight is uh, our Congressman uh, Jim McGovern has co-sponsored uh, a reciprocal access to Tibet bill, which is called the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act of 2017, to promote access for American citizen diplomats, journalists, to be able to visit Tibet, just as the Chinese citizens, students, diplomat, journalists are able to come and visit this country. Uh, and we would like the town of Amherst to express its support for this resolution as well. Um, if there are any questions or clarification that you would like, we'll be happy to do that. 
Um, actually, uh, to begin with, this is a question for you, Mr. Chair. It looks like in our motion and in um, the proclamation we have before us, it doesn't have 59 days. It says March 10th to March 17th. Right, I was going to raise that. We had, the, sorry. We just, we were using the text of the previous resolution there. I did not change that. We can amend it silently or in practice, and we can sign the resolution or as you I'm also not sure what. You noticed that too. I yeah. figured we were pulling it from last year. Yeah, I'm also not sure what, if there are any conflicts, any other flags to be flown at that time or. Not for two months, I'm not sure. Um, Probably not, but yeah. Well, we can we certainly could, pass the resolution well, we, as written. We could pass this and come back and add to it if we found out that it was possible, but it's not, not something we've done before. And the other yeah. sort of <clears throat> clarification was um, in your presentation, you, you just ask us to affirm certain um, principles, but that's actually not part of the motion or the resolution, so that would be something else. Right. I, the, yeah, in looking at the revision of the text, my sense was that the proclamation is a fairly focused thing about the day and the general commemoration, the other requests for separate things, and if they should be part of a motion, it should be a separate motion, I think, or a different discussion. May I just ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Uh, have you received our application for this year? The letter that the letter that you from what you were reading? Yes. Yes. February okay. 20, Yes, twenty first. Okay. Yes. In my packet. So, do we? So, if you, can we ask the applicant to? Did they see the text of the proclamation that is drafted? or Because right. there's a disconnect here. Yes, that's what I'm realizing yeah. as well. Um, you submitted to us your letter, which we have. But um, what we did not do was to incorporate some of that language into the proclamation itself. Did you see the proclamation that we had produced? And we've obviously altered a little bit to get a little more of the specifics of, I, of things from the I haven't seen the okay. proclamation. I, the same was, as last year. I was given a copy of the previous years. Right, right. Not, that's not, not an updated version of this. Uh, Oops, sorry. I'm taking suggestions. Okay. I was just going to say, since I was, I was responsible for this, I took last year's proclamation and changed the dates to make it current, but I wasn't sure that the kind of things being asked for here were appropriate for a proclamation. This is, they're different, you know, to ask us to write a letter or take a stance on something mm -hmm. is a separate action. So okay. we thought it was best to keep the proclamation clean as in the past, so we can go ahead and get that done right away for March 10th. And we can discuss the other issues if we need to. Okay. But to, to me, they didn't, seem, they didn't seem proclamation material. Right. So I think that just for simplicity's sake, if nothing else, we'll probably do the proclamation now, mm -hmm. and then we can come back to this later in the meeting to talk more in depth about the other, right. other okay. topics that you, you brought forward to us and, and um, the other asks, as it were. Okay. Um, so I think that'll be the simplest. Okay. Um, and and uh, so if, given that, <laughs> if someone would like to um, make a motion and or read the proclamation read the proclamation or both I would King of read the proclamation. yeah I'm looking for the motion read the proclamation too right should I read it first or the I think you should read it first whoops oh you know what okay do you have the and do you have the version that has the article 29 of the May 20, 2015 that's from race day, race day every day. Oh, that's the wrong one. Yeah. That would it's explain why I'm confused. Mm -hmm. We have many proclamations. I know. It's, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Whereas on March 10th, 2018, Tibetans throughout the world will gather to commemorate the 59th anniversary of the Tibetan National Uprising against the occupation of their country and in honor of the more than 1 million Tibetans who have died in the struggle for the independence of Tibet, and whereas the occupation and ongoing suppression of human rights and freedom in Tibet and the degradation of Tibetan culture and identity should continue to be a concern for all freedom-loving people everywhere. And whereas His Holiness the Dalai Lama is an icon, a global icon of compassion and peace and the heart and soul for Tibetans worldwide 
and whereas members of the local Tibetan community will gather in Northampton to commemorate this day with a day-long solidarity fast to pay tribute to the brave men and women who have given their lives for the cause of freedom and democracy. And now, therefore, be it hereby resolved that we, the Select Board of the Town of Amherst in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, recognize the local Tibetan community's plea for justice on this 59th anniversary of the Tibetan National Uprising Day and continue to proclaim each March 10th as Tibet Day and further, by hoisting the Tibetan national flag from March 10th to March 17th, 2018, help cultivate awareness for all citizens of Amherst. And the motion then reads. So before we read that, did we want to alter that ending date or not at this point? I th okay. I think we're not sure we can do it, so. Okay, so we'll take it as is and, and then we'll just work from there. Okay. So go ahead. And then I move to proclaim March 10th, 2018 as Tibet Day in the town of Amherst and to prevent the Tibetan national flag to fly under the United Nations flag on the North Common from March 10th, 2018 through March 17th, 2018. Second. So we have a motion and a second. <coughs> Is there further discussion? So I would like to go ahead and we could go ahead and vote on this as far as I'm concerned because we do do this annually and we appreciate this being brought to us. And thank you to Mr. Wald for updating it as well as Ms. Puppel. But then to have a separate conversation about how much of a conversation we're going to have about the other question of how long and the other details that were, writ that were read to us that were in the letter of February 21st. Right. Yeah, we'll definitely get back to those much later in the meeting probably. <laughs> I want to keep our guests a long time, but is there other discussion about the motion that's on, on the floor? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> it looks like there was, more was there <laughs> another comment that wanted to be, that you wanted, it's unanimous with one person so, absent. Yes. I just want to make, before we tell people they can go or they should go or they can come back later or whatever, um, once we know that that's true, then I think we have a couple of things to talk about in terms of do we want to find out because it's a particular anniversary if we can do it longer because we just ha don't happen to know at this point mm -hmm. if there are any other flags that we were planning to. I mean, none come immediately to mind, but that doesn't necessarily mean there aren't. And then how we're going to talk about the other items because although some of the items are quite easily referenced in the proclamation itself. Item seven in particular jumps out at me as being mm -hmm. something that I don't believe the select board has any familiarity with as a select board. And so while individuals of us may be very familiar with that and certainly want to, to sign on in support of such a thing, I'm uncomfortable with expecting the select board to do the level of research to find out that if as a select board we should do all those things. A similar point. Again, I think there is none, no example in my experience of flying a flag for more than a month, and so it wasn't didn't seem appropriate to put that into the resolution before we could discuss it. And then the, the same point about some of these things. They're political statements and so forth, and we have no knowledge or background really to make these judgments without further preparation, I believe. Okay. I was just going to add, because yes, if we're going to talk about it later, I think we would be talking about if we're going to at a future date have a more substantial conversation mm -hmm. so that um, the applicants aren't, aren't sitting here for two hours right. and then we, right. you know, because we're going to talk about it, and we're, we're going to, as Ms. Bruce said, talk about talking about it, but we won't have the <laughs> substantive decision-making conversation tonight. That's correct. That's correct. So we will we'll take this up a little bit, get ourselves prepared to have the, a more actionable okay. uh, discussion later most likely, but we'll, we'll discuss this in a little more detail later on, but not take any action. Okay. When, you, when you say later on, is it going to be today? So we'll, as, as um, Ms. Kruger was just saying, we'll probably talk about how we'd like to sort of structure our conversation a little bit, okay. but not get into the specifics of it, and then we'll pick a date and we'll let you know if we, okay. it, won't, it won't be you know, June, <laughs> okay. obviously, because that would be a little <laughs> counterproductive. So it, we'll have to That'll be part of that conversation, too, is sort of what the timing is of that. I, with the chair's indulgence, I would suggest that there is no reason at this point to presume that we will have a future meeting at the, about this. We could talk about tonight whether we wish to have not right. just what it would look like. Right. It may not go beyond tonight's um, right. agenda. Right. So Thank obviously you. we would let the petitioners know Right. what our decision is, whether it's to have an additional conversation another night or to stop where we are for right. this year. Right. So 
So I think that, yes. Oh, just that. I'm sorry that what you were asking for didn't jive with what we thought we were supposed to be doing because, you know, we get our information, we get our packets at the end of the week, and I don't know about other people. I, I often look at it Sunday night or Monday morning, and um, maybe next year there could, we could have more of a back and forth between the language of the proclamation and what you're asking for because while we did get it, literally it wasn't digested in a way until sure. just before that we realized there was this disconnect between what we were asking for and what we were ready to give you. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, I think it's absolutely understandable. And we would be also be very happy to provide some of the resources from which some of these languages are taken so that you have the complete information. Um, but I would like to request, if it's at all possible, for the flying the flag for 59 days, because this is the 59th anniversary, and that's how we would like to be able to sort of really uh, mark this day um, to show our solidarity with the Tibetans inside Tibet. Mr. Wall. Could I ask a question to the sure. petitioners? Yeah, because I was a little bit puzzled why, why 59? You know, in our decimal-based culture, we tend to do things 50 years or 60 years, and does this mean we'd be flying it for 60 days next year and 61 after that, or what would the request, what's the logic behind this? Yes, I think that would be, yeah, that would be thinking. That would be the thinking. We thought about um, a number 160 as a possible number because since 2008, um, we've had at least 160 Tibetans who have self-immolated mm -hmm. uh, in protest against the Chinese government rules and regulations. And we felt like 160 days for flying a flag uh, might be too long. And so mm -hmm. to make it more reasonable, we feel at least if we stick with the 59th anniversary, it's much more reasonable than 160 days. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, it does raise just general questions, too. So if we fly the flag for 30 days for Black History Month and we do the flag for Puerto Rican Month, and so, you know, is there supposed to be any kind of equity between these things or is it going to depend on anniversaries? So I think we need a longer conversation mm -hmm. about that right. before yeah. changing a longstanding policy. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so next, uh, we have the... Uh, since we have guests here, we'll have the uh, proclamation relative to the skating club's 50th anniversary. So I think we have some folks here. To, um, Let's pull up another chair. So just introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about uh, your request. I'm Rita Lehman. Um, I'm a resident of Amherst since 1961, and I'm the president of the Skating Club of Amherst. I'm Nancy Johnson, and I'm a new board member to the Skating Club this year, and I have two children that skate with the club for the past seven years. Okay. And just to give you a little information about the Skating Club, um, we began in 1968 when a group of um, mothers from the community wanted a place for their children to learn how to figure skate, and there just wasn't any. And Amherst College very graciously um, welcomed us into um, their faculty and staff and student hours. And that's how we started. And it grew to about 68, 70 members at that time. And we continued to skate at Amherst College um, their season is the shot season, just their hockey season, which from November through the end of February. We then, uh, when the UMass Mullen Center opened in 1993, we had the opportunity to extend our season um, from September through June. And we continued, we took ice time there and we continued to skate at both Oil Rink and the Mullen Center. And we have right now a membership of about 150 members. <clears throat> and we offer figure skating instruction, a learn to skate program for people who have no, have just learning how to skate. We run adult programs. We run ice dancing programs, power skating classes. And 
it has really been a very successful organization. We're a nonprofit organization run entirely by volunteers, and we have a professional coaching staff of about uh, 10 coaches. And we really are very excited about marking, this is a very important milestone for us, 50 years. We've always been in the Amherst area. We actually um, service people from from all of the surrounding areas, Belchertown, Greenfield, uh, Hadley, Northampton, everywhere, as well as some as surrounding states, as well as Connecticut and New Hampshire. So um, we are very, we're re requesting that the town of Amherst um, acknowledge this milestone, this 50 years, and just congratulate us on that successful organization. Thank you. So, to that end, um, does someone want to uh, read the proclamation and or, yes? I'd be happy to. I know we'll probably have some discussion, but I might as well get started. <clears throat> so, this is the proclamation of congratulations to the Skating Club of Amherst, the 50th anniversary, 1968 to 2018. Mm -hmm. Whereas, the Skating Club of Amherst was founded in November 1968 by the faculty, staff, and families of Amherst College to provide recreational opportunities for the campus community and soon after invited the wider Amherst community to join. And whereas, the Skating Club of Amherst has continued to operate at the Amherst College or Rink and the University of Massachusetts Mullins Center Community Rink and whereas, the Skating Club of Amherst has provided and continues to offer a home to a community of families, amateur athletes, and professionals dedicated to the sport of figure skating, provides a safe and positive environment for members' physical, emotional, and social development, and whereas the Skating Club of Amherst is a member of the United States Figure Skating Association, the national governing body for the sport in the United States. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Select Board of the Town of Amherst hereby congratulates the Skating Club of Amherst upon its 50th anniversary. I've voted this and dated this 26th day of February 2018. Would you like me to read the motion? Um, I move to authorize a proclamation congratulating the Amherst Skating Club on its 50th anniversary. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Yes. So, as was clearly indicated in all the material provided to us and on the proclamation, it's called the Skating Club of yes. Amherst, not the Amherst Skating Thank Club. Thank you. And that does matter to people. It goes with their logo and everything else. Oh, in terms of the motion, correct? Yeah, my the motion. motion's wrong. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, you you read what you were given. <laughs> yeah, I know, but sometimes I catch it, and I did read these ahead, but okay. Um, Got it. So Ms. Kruger indicated that there might be some discussion, and as the petitioners may have heard when this idea first came up, I was a little dubious, not because I don't think the Skating Club of Amherst is a fantastic organization. Having had both my children participate, I was just asking my husband now if he remembered when our older son, who's now just about 24, was part of Chip and the Chipettes at the <laughs> Mullen Center during a <laughs> hockey halftime. And if any of you have been to a UMass hockey game, you know that the fans are not the most genteel on occasion. <laughs> but when hockey. all these adorable little skaters, including that little boy, <laughs> skated out there, it definitely changed the tone. Um, but I was dubious only because of the practice of uh, some people assume that we should just like proclaim everything. It's a 50 year anniversary. I don't think you run across that too often. And so I'm very happy to go ahead and agree to this. Oh, your reservations fell away. <laughs> well, oh I tried not to have it be about my kid, but it is about my kid. Too. <laughs> That's quite all right. Did I then I won't Understood. give all my speeches that I prepared. Right. A 50 year anniversary is really Right. So is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. And congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you, so Thank you very much. much. Congrats. Actually, the hockey game was just Saturday that the Chip has performed at the last one. Yeah. Last exactly. Time. And they are so well received by the, yes. by the audience. It's amazing. It, it, it makes yeah. things so much nicer. Yeah. <laughs> I know. 
So thank you so much. We'll sign the official one at the end of our meeting and we'll get it to you okay, in good. the next couple of days thank or so. Thank so you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you for coming. for coming. Thank you. Great. So since we're proclaiming things, <laughs> we have one more proclamation this evening, which has to do with uh, Race Amity Day, which I don't think we have folks here for that. So if someone were to uh, want to find the right company. Yes. Read that one. Either way. So I'll dive in if you don't mind, Mr. Please. Slaughter. Go right ahead. So the one, she says, is. looking for the replacement. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Got it. You got it. Okay. Okay. So Race Amity Day proclamation. Back in 2015, Town meeting had an article, Article 29 of the annual town meeting session, established the second Sunday of June as Race Amity Day. There was a wonderful presentation. There was much discussion. There was town meeting voted yes. And then that's all that happened. <laughs> that was the end of it. And so we realized here on the select board that we should go ahead and make sure we bring this to people's attention again every year. It isn't until June, so this time we have plenty of notice for people, which is great because it can affiliate with Black History Month very nicely. There was just an event co-sponsored by the Citizens for Racial Amity, which was at the Jones Library yesterday. And I double checked with them to ensure that there would in fact be an event on the 10th because every year the events a little <coughs> different. The very first year that it was celebrated it was celebrated in conjunction with the Human Rights Commission long running Human Rights Heroes Awards. But that became a little too much celebration to cram into one event. And so they have now separated those events. So it's always the second Sunday, and that happens to be June 10th this year. And I wanted to make sure, and I appreciate the people who worked on behind the scenes, making sure that each year this proclamation includes the town meeting action reference, because that is why we do it. It isn't because the governor and his wisdom decided to sign on to it as well at some point, although that's nice. We don't, he does lots of things we don't sign on to. but. <laughs> This is something that Amherst should be proud of, and I'm happy that we are doing this again. And we will have more information as the event itself unfolds as to what it's gonna look like this year, where it will be, what it will look like. We'll certainly end up on the town website in some fashion. And I would be happy to read said proclamation as well, which is, whereas the greatest asset of the town of Amherst is its people, and whereas the town of Amherst holds dear the motto of the United States of America, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, recognizing the principle of the oneness of the humankind and the rich cultural, ethnic, and racial diversity of its inhabitants, and whereas civility, respect, kindness, and friendship are commonly shared values of the collective citizenry of the town of Amherst, and whereas the town of Amherst invites communities and neighborhoods to join in reflection on the beauty and richness of our diverse cultures and ethnicities while reaching out with a spirit of amity toward one another. Whereas chapter 163 of the Acts of 2015 of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts establishes the second Sunday in June annually as Race Amity Day, Whereas Amherst Town Meeting voted Article 29 of the May 20th, 2015 session of the annual town meeting to establish the second Sunday of June as Race Amity Day and urged all the people of Amherst to recognize this event and to celebrate its annual observance. Now, <coughs> therefore, the town of Amherst hereby proclaims Sunday, June 10th, 2018 to be Race Amity Day, a celebration of oneness of the human family voted and dated this 26th date of February 2018. And the actual motion reads, to proclaim, move to proclaim June 10th, 2018 as Race Amity Day in the town of Amherst and to urge all citizens to recognize the import of this event and participate fittingly in its observance. Second. Is there further discussion? <clears throat> none all those in what, yes. what miss brewer read isn't an exact match to what was in the packet the only thing i changed but was the, add oh that's because the packets out of date oh there was a new my, one on our desk it's tonight. on my desk yeah. okay. the difference no, the no, difference fine. was simply know, including the town time. meeting article i got it right. i just didn't know we have a replacement because we had to sign it later got yeah. it. right yep we have a replacement to sign later as i understand it mm -hmm. that's correct got it. 
any further discussion. Excellent. I'd like to add the word Sunday to the motion since it's a little hard to add it to the proclamation at this point because it looks nice and we don't want to scribble on it. But if we would include it in the Red motion marker, itself, you know. yeah, make it look extra good. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but to make sure it's clear it's Sunday since it's, okay. it's not that many events are on Sundays. Okay. Right. Somebody seconded already. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it's been moved and seconded. Good. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous with one person absent as well. Thank you for that. We've had a couple of other groups come in that, that um, have some agenda items for us. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, under our licenses, public way and meter parking reservations, we have a couple of uh, road closures and parking reservations. Um, and so, uh, the first of those we'll take up, uh, which I will suggest we pull out of the uh, of the consent calendar. The first one is the 2018 Farmers Market Road Closure and Parking Reservation, April 21st to November 17th, 2018. I believe you guys are here. Did you want to speak to us about that and tell us a little bit about? So if you just make sure to identify yourself on the microphone so that folks at home know who it is that's speaking to us and. We'll go from there. Well, first of all, David Mahowski is my name, and I'm the manager, <coughs> excuse me, of the Amherst Farmers Market. Um, I was invited to come here tonight to introduce myself, so hello to the select board, and thank you very much. Um, we are again asking for the parking lot on Spring Street from April 21st through November 17th to be closed off in part of Boltwood Avenue for the L shape of the uh, marketplace. And um, just want to say also to the select board committee that we really appreciate the support. The market's been in operation since 1972 in that spot. And we think we bring in a nice commodity and a, certainly a good amount of foot traffic to the town on Saturdays. Um, local count lately has been upwards of 4,000 pitter-pattering steps through the marketplace that are spending their money. So Saturdays are pretty active on the common. Mm -hmm. Did select board have any questions for Ms. Brewer? This question may be more for you than, or perhaps for both of you, is although it doesn't indicate on the application or in our motion that there's any change from last year in terms of the number of parking spaces, every year the, cha the time seems to change a little bit. Now, it's quite possible that the time is identical to last year, but I just want to verify that that is indeed the time we're looking at, that 7 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. in terms of we've had length, somewhat lengthy discussions in the past about what time starts, what time ends, and I just want to make sure everybody's good with that time. Maybe some clarity. The market runs from 8 to 1.30. 1 1.30. So, uh, the 7 o'clock or the 7.30 or whatever you've seen over past previous years or that flexibility is, is usually when the vendors are getting there to, to set up. Um, it's easier for the market to set up earlier. So 7 o'clock would be asked for. Actually, most of the vendors are starting to show up at 6 o'clock and that way we're just not ending up elbowing anybody else if there's a common event or whatnot. But the official time, from what I understand, and I've been involved with the market since 1986, has been 7 o'clock to 1.30 from set up to closing. To follow up, you haven't been the manager that's been coming through before us for the last couple of years. That so that's why true. I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing it a long time, yeah, but me, you weren't the one stuck that. there in that seat I, I the last couple 80, of years. I 86 to 2002. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then I, I left to have children. Because Thank we just, you. Saturdays are a hot commodity, especially yeah. raising two young daughters. Absolutely. Shopping in the market in May, they asked me to come back. There has been a litany of managers the last six, yeah. five or exactly. six years, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've been back there this season. Uh, essentially, just I can't sugarcoat it, we're trying to right the ship. So right. getting things yeah. back on, on track. And I think we've made a lot of progress this year. Everybody seems to be much happier with how things are going. The vendors are happier. The customers are happier. Um, we've got some nice connections with the town, with BID, with the Jeff, the Lord Jeff, whatever that's going to be renamed as. Um, so the market integration within the town, I think, is back on a good mend. And we certainly had a lot of good foot traffic. So it was just nice to see all around. It just seems to be there's a synergy coming back, which 
as a shopper, I got to say, I didn't realize what had happened over the last five or six years with the revolving door management, et cetera, that had been an issue. Um, <clears throat> as a shopper, it wasn't as evident. But um, I've had lots of surprises this year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Did you want to read the motion? Um, actually, I want to ask another question. Yep. Or I, I guess at this point it becomes a comment, which is to, to follow up on that right. Obviously, we are recognizing that there have been several different managers before us over the last couple of years. Sometimes they didn't appear before us. Other times we had questions from the Agricultural Commission, et cetera. But everything I'm hearing right now is that as you're riding the ship, that there is nothing we need to change. There's nothing we need to be concerned about this year. And so I'm wondering if we could go ahead and add to the motion, just for clarity's sake this year, that the market hours themselves are 8 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And so I, I, the focus has to be on the parking because that's what somebody has to go and enforce. <laughs> but right. I want to make sure I just, like, even if we just tack it on at the end for hours of operation or something along those lines. Mr. Steinberg usually wordsmiths that <laughs> sort of thing for us. But if Ms. Kruger wants to do it on the fly, that works well for me too. Yeah. Um, one note of clarity I'd like to throw out there is that there's a request for six parking spaces on South Pleasant. Is that correct? Five. First five metered parking spaces on the east side of South Pleasant Street, originating at Spring Street, <coughs> moving south toward College Street. So I, I should just throw this out there. On Boltwood Avenue, we need a few spots, which are, which are in the requests and granted every year. We don't need five spots on South Pleasant Street. I was wondering so, about that. Pardon me? I, I, don't, I don't see it necessary taking up five. In fact, I think that's a bit of an inconvenience, frankly. If we had two, I think we're golden. I'm changing the motion. We can make it two. Uh, yeah. Less is always easier. <laughs> well, this one thing I've noticed this year, we don't use those spots. So I don't see the uh, need in having them taking up and being a burden. So if we have two, we're golden. No, go for two. But I just I want to clarify, this would be on South Pleasant. Which two? The South Pleasant area. Yeah, I got that. Um, yeah, okay. we want to make sure you get it you the right two. Is it the first two? Yeah, it's near the bus stop. So Bill Gowan can so pull his little two. wagon up. Yeah, the first two would be plenty. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, if we, if we could open those back up to the public, that'd I, be fine. I was hoping for that. As long as we have this, as we're golden. As long golden. as you have yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for the extension. Yeah. Okay, is yeah. it still first two? So first okay, two. I'm, happy, I'm happy to read the motion. Yeah, please. Okay, I'm going to read the motion. It's a little bit long, so bear with me, and I think I've modified it according to what I heard. I move to... Approve the closure of that section of Spring Street beginning at the intersection of South Pleasant heading east to the intersection with <coughs> Boltwood Avenue each Saturday beginning April 21st, 2018 through November 17th, 2018 from 7 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. to accommodate the hours of operation from 8 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Um, oops, that's probably not where that part, that clause goes. Um, that section of Boltwood Avenue beginning at the intersection of Spring Street running south to the access way to Porter Hall and further to approve the reservation of the first two metered parking spaces on the east side of South Pleasant Street originating at Spring Street moving south toward College Street for the Amherst Farmers Market. David. Mikowski. Mikowski, silently, but close enough. Mikowski, <laughs> Mikowski, market market manager. Yes. Is second. there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, probably the wrong place to stick in word, but it works. But. David Mikowski, the returning old manager. Would you like the old? No, because you were there a couple yeah. places. Are you the old new manager or the new old manager? Both. <laughs> Either way, potato. Potatoes. Both. Yes. Six to one. Is, okay. is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. And hope you have and a good thanks. season. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Boy, that's a long one, too. And so I believe we also have folks here for the Daffodil Run, which is our other street closure that is on our agenda tonight, which will actually segue into our next item. But <laughs> but <won't. laughs> we since we're talking about streets, but if you want to come forward, please. Okay. Um, and so again, uh, just state who you are and tell us a little bit about the event and why it's a little different this year than in past and sure. those kind of things. Please. Well, 
Hi, I'm Jen Label, Development Director with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. And the Daffodil Run is in support of Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, and we are in our eighth year with this event. So last year was the first year that we requested um, a street closure. So we had closed um, North Pleasant um, until from Kendrick Park until Main Street. And we had requested a 15 minute closure starting at 10 a.m. sharp, which we did, and we actually only needed to close the street for um, eight minutes, so um, it was a very brief closure. We are again asking for 15 minutes, um, and we are also asking for an official closure of what we're calling Old North Pleasant, and I'm not sure if that's actually a real term, but that's how we refer to it. So that's the portion of um, North Pleasant um, that extends from uh, Halleck Street to Triangle, and that is where the race shoot is. So the start of the race and the end of the race um, is along that portion of the street. Um, and in past years, it has been used, but not officially closed. Um, but so essentially it was um, blocked with people and the race equipment, um, but not with an official closure. Um, so this year we're requesting that, and that is the new request. Um, and I'm not sure, when I looked at the packet online, I, it does appear that um, folks have maps, um, but I didn't see it on the packet online, so if you need additional information, I did make copies of the maps. Yes. Um, from that map, though, is it? Does this look Based on the maps that you provided us. Is it the So does that seem? So yeah, so triangle to McClellan. Yep. So that would be. Looks so much larger than, than I imagine it. But anyway, so that portion of road um, for the duration of the race, and then McClellan to Halleck, or no? Oh, this is the only. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. This is only Kendrick. So that's just one request. This is the. So. So this map shows the new request only. Yes. That so shows the new show. request only. Right. Would you like a map that details both requests? We, we have the or? route maps, yes. which okay. outline the part. And, and it's clear from, I mean, hopefully from the, uh, the motion that the portion that's uh, basically from the start until you get to, where is it, Main Street or so, is the other chunk of roadway, if I'm not mistaken. And so that obviously is quickly because it's the beginning of the race for everybody. So it's yes. running really fast because they're fresh. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> Everybody's bunched together. So it goes quickly. It goes um, very quickly. And we've been working um, with police captain Gunderson on this closure. Um, so we feel very confident in the plan. And like I said, we did the, the closure for less than 15 minutes last year. And I don't anticipate needing more than that. Um, so. Great. In terms of the, the electronic packet, the map that Ms. Brewer had, that is in the electronic packet. The okay. other ske the sketch plan ones we saw are not, not in electronic. Right. So, would you question. like to make, Okay. So, I'm going to go with someone else's being clear on what the description is because. I never want to go north, south, east, or west in writing if I can help it. But I don't think we should call it Old North Pleasant in here because that's not, that's mm -hmm. how many of us think of it, but that's <laughs> not, not what the words. Called. And so make sure that we get the East Pleasant and North Pleasant reference correct in there mm -hmm. based on the actual finalized map. So I'll leave that to someone more less directionally challenged than I am. Does someone want to read motion? Are you scared of if, Well, if it's moving north, it's to the intersection with East Pleasant Street, isn't it? Not really. It's mm -hmm. triangle. Triangle. 
Let's try okay, so way. somebody fill <laughs> change the streets in our motion. <laughs> All right, Mr. Bachelman. Okay, to approve the closure of that section of North Pleasant Street beginning at the intersection of Halleck Street and moving north to the intersection of Triangle Street. Uh, Sounds good. I am directionally challenged. And then the rest would be the same as. I suppose I could make a motion. Yeah. So I think I'll do that. Yeah, just I So I move to approve the closure of that section of North I'm Pleasant Street beginning at the intersection part. of Halleck Street and moving north to the intersection of Triangle Street from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. and North Pleasant Street from East Pleasant Street to Main Street from 10 a.m. to 10.15 a.m. on Sunday, April 29th, 2018 for the CHD Big Brothers Big Sisters annual Daffodil Run. Jen Lovell. Center for Human Development. Second. Okay. So are we clear on where we're closing the roads? Mm -hmm. We think. We are. Okay. <laughs> Most importantly is the police officers know where they're They, they, they recommended this. All right. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you very members. much. Thank you. I, uh, uh, I'm noticing on my motion sheet that there is a second part to the uh, farmer's yes. market. Oh, we did, did we not read that? I was wondering We that. did no, not. We did okay. not. So if you'd like to, we But we, it is on the map. Yeah. So if you'd like to read that right. section, second okay. section right. of that. that was <clears throat> Move to approve the reservation of the first two metered parking spaces on the east side of Boldwood Avenue, immediately south of the Porter Access Driveway, exclusively for guests of the Lord Jeffrey Inn, each Saturday beginning April 21st, 2018, to November 17th, 2018, from 7 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And are we going to leave that the same or add Ms. Kruger's justification of it? <laughs> I think it's clear enough because they do the hours that are involved. Okay. Second. All right. There's a motion and a second for the discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous as well. All right. So we've done all the straightforward, Easy in quotes, sort of things. <laughs> Um, so I think next on our agenda is, is back to our action and discussion items. I believe since we have a guest that's come to town to talk to us about our paving plan that we will change the order a little bit and go with section 4B, which is the 2018 road construction and paving plan first look. Uh, and then we'll come back to the Shea Street and school zone after that. So make sure you introduce yourself so we know we kind of know who you are, most of us, but. Hi, I'm Jason Skeels, town engineer. Hi, I'm Salar Shaini. I'm a data scientist and GIS developer with Street Scan. Great. Is that the bottom one? The bottom one. Yes. You should have copies of this handout in your, on your desk. So I'm going to um, go over the, so I, I, mean, I, I remember most of you from last time that uh, I presented here. So I'm here to share with you the results of our second scan in Amherst. And uh, we work closely with Jason and his team and, and once we get to the capital improvement plan, plan uh, I will hand it over to Jason to go over um, what streets are going to be repaired in the next five years. So this is the, our data collection van. Um, you probably remember it from last time. Uh, we spent a total of four days um, in Amherst, a total of 40 hours to scan everything. Um, we spent about 10 hours on the field each day. And our van is the same as the last time, which, which would allow us to make comparisons uh, where we had uh, optical sensors, cameras behind and in front, of the, in front of the van to take pictures every meter of, on the roadway. And uh, we had radars uh, behind the vehicle that would gauge the distance between underneath the van and the surface, and that would allow us to map uh, potholes and uh, surface, other surface distresses. The data layers that we provided at the end, uh, I'm just gonna go over them quickly. Uh, one, which the main driver of the system is the PCI of the pavement condition index. 
that's an overall uh, rating of, of the pavement that would give you information about everything from zero to 100, and zero is being the road is in a very, very bad shape, and 100 is it's in the best shape possible. And the map on the right side is essentially the PCI map of Amherst, where in the dark green areas and light green areas, the roads are in good shape, yellow fair, orange, um, are poor and red are in a very, very bad shape. And the second layer that would be extracted from the PCI layer, uh, mainly, I mean, there are other distresses that go in there in the decision trees, uh, is the maintenance method layer. That's a, what we are looking at on the map is a color-coded map of maintenance methods that each segment or each street would benefit from. So the dark green areas are the areas that we don't have, we have time, we, can, we don't have to repair. Uh, do any repairs on them yet. Light green are preventive repair, like crack sealing, microsurfacing, and blue are the rehabs. Um, and orange, they are beyond the rehab stage and they just essentially need to be reconstructed. And you should be happy that you don't see any oranges here because there are in meetings that I show this and there is a sea of orange. Uh, so. The other data layers that we provided are the pothole and the uh, metal layers. So on the left side, we see the pothole layer where we had mapped out the location of all the potholes. Uh, so this would be a snapshot of when we drove over. I mean, it would, it would change frequently. But it would kind of give you an idea of where the trouble spots are and which areas of the town are more prone to deterioration. And on the right side, we see the location of all the utility covers, valve covers, and, and manholes that, that the system mapped out. Uh, and lastly, we, for every meter of the roadway, the, the imagery from our cameras are available. So if you go to our software and you click on any segment, you would uh, see what that number, if you, if you want to see what, for example, the PCF 60 means, you just click on a segment and the image would pop up and you would, it would give you a better idea of what that means. Uh, we worked with uh, Jason and his team to integrate this into the town's web GIS, so if you actually go into this, uh, this link, you would be able to uh, visualize the PCI and click on each segment and see what's, uh, what's the rating for each road. And it's, it's an interactive uh, web map, which is, which is uh, public, so you would be able to view it. Now, after that, I, I will just go over the results uh, town-wide. So the distribution of PCI uh, in the town um, are that are uh, around 21% are in a very good shape, excellent shape. 19% are in a good shape. 22% fair. 16% um, are in a poor, and 11 uh, and the rest are in a very good poor shape. So we kind of have a same uh, chunk of roads in each in each category. The average PCI is a 63 and we'll show later well, how does it compare to last year, uh, two years ago that we did the scan. And um, around 72% are above a critical PCI level and 28% below a critical level. Below a critical PCI level means when the pavement is exhibiting a structural failures. So that's when we, we need to, if it's in, in the right stage, we need to do some repairs before it goes to the reconstruction stage and where it would be very, very expensive for us. So this is a more detailed breakdown. Um, Around 0.9 miles are uh, were dirt roads or concrete roads, or they were blocked and we couldn't assess them. Around 2.6 miles were below 10, um, 7 miles, 10 to 25, 11.5 uh, miles between 25 and 40. Between 40 and 55, you had around 24% of the roads. This is a very critical stage where the road is on the verge of going to the reconstruction stage, uh, so you can save it by doing some rehab work. and. Uh, 25 miles are between 55 and 70, and the rest are above a 70, which is, a, which, which is when the road is in very good shape. Now in terms of the repairs that we need to do on the, on the roads, uh, around 22%, which, which are around 22 miles, uh, they, they, re they need to be reconstructed. So they are beyond, um, any, any no, no other repair method would work. Around 43 miles uh, would benefit from rehab, 22 miles would benefit from preventive re repairs like crack sealing, microsurfacing, and about 13 miles uh, are in a very good shape and we don't need to worry about maintenance. The costs that we used for estimating the 
uh, repair methods. We, we worked with uh, Jason to estimate that so from your historical repair costs so that it's, it's as close as possible to, um, to Amherst. So this is a summary of our findings. The, the weighted average of PCI for the entire town was a 63. 28% of roads, uh, a little more than a quarter, are structurally damaged. And if you want to repair everything at this moment uh, and bring everything to a PCI of 100, you would need $16 million. And if you, if you include the contingencies and police costs and other things that, are, that go with the maintenance, that would add up to around $28 million. This is the annual progress. So from the last time we did the scan, actually the uh, total backlog was reduced uh, significantly and the, the PCI was increased by one point, which is a, that's a, that's a significant increase <coughs> in overall because every road is deteriorating and you just can repair certain roads. So one point increase is a good, uh, is a good number. And, and we can see that the backlog has been reduced for about um, two, $2 million which means it's on the right track. In terms of payment management program, uh, so the prioritization factors that the system considers, uh, they are a functional class and traffic, so a road that, uh, that so to figure out which road we should repair first, uh, one of the main factors is the functional class. So if a road is a highway versus if it is, is a local road or residential road, uh, the highway one is gonna get repaired first. Then the condition is important, the PCI, um, so in addition to how many people live on a street, it's also in, it takes into account what's the PCI of that, that road. The third uh, parameter, which is uh, as important as the other ones, are the benefit to cost ratio. So each repair method would uh, come with a, would, would extend the life of the pavement up to a certain number of years. And uh, that's the benefit that we get. For example, crack seal would extend three to five years. Uh, and cost is how much money we spend. So that ratio would, would give us the... the value of that repair on that segment. For example, crack seals are very cheap, but they also don't extend the life that much. So if, so if they are right, done at the right time, uh, they, are, they have a very high benefit to cost ratio. And finally, the available budget, which is the main constraint for us. So these are the projections that um, with different budget scenarios, how how the average uh, PCI of the network would change. So $800,000 would be the minimum that you would need to maintain what you have. Uh, and if you want to see uh, increase, depending on your goals, if you want to see five point increase in five years to get to a 69, you would require around $2 million each year. Um, so that's the green plot. And uh, you know, with, with a budget of $1.5 million a year, so if you almost double 800,000, which is the minimum you need to maintain, you would get after five years to a 67. So this kind of shows you, gives you an idea of depending on the goal that you have, uh, whether maintain it or make it better, how much, how much money you would need to invest each year. So now I, I would uh, turn it, hand it over to Jason, who, is, who will show you the capital improvement plan. So this is our um, five-year plan. Uh, and we use their data analysis to sort of recommend um, uh, what should go first. You know, what, like uh, the cost benefit analysis is basically the, the sort of bang for your buck. And, and the, the other big factor is the, the, the ADT, you know, the, the use of the road. Um, so we, uh, we have to focus on the main roads first because if they go, they cost a lot more to do full reconstruction versus just doing, you know, some, some maintenance type work, which we're going to do a, a pretty healthy amount of maintenance work this year on some pretty heavily traveled roads. So um, some of the first roads that came up on the street scan list were roads that we already had programmed from last year. Um, so Dickinson Street, we, we had just replaced sewer and water on that. Uh, we knew the road was in horrible shape, but also knew it needed infrastructure. So um, that uh, we've already got a contract for that from Main to College Street. We're also going to be adding sidewalks and parking um, and, and re redoing the entire road, uh, full depth reconstruction, so that we can work all that stuff into it. Uh, next one is East Pleasant Street, which this was just part of the, uh, the roundabout work. Um, so it's just an extension from the roundabout to Halleck Street. Um, we're just going to mill and overlay that section just to just to 
smooth out the existing pavement from all the trench patches. Um, so those were on the list, but we had already sort of had them programmed in. Um, then for this coming summer, we have East Pleasant Street, Southeast Street, Main Street, North Pleasant, and West Bay Road are the first six, no, sorry, first five. And um, they, they were quite big budget chunks, but we're going to try and do a couple different treatments on each. We're looking at doing a cold in place recycling on East Pleasant Street and Southeast Street, uh, which are both in relatively good shape, but they're starting to fail. So if we grab them now, we should get hopefully another 10 years out of them rather than letting them keep go. And then we're going back to square one and rebuilding the entire road again. Um, and the same with Main Street right here in front of Town Hall from Boltwood to um, Dickinson, or that's going to be a mill uh, and mill and repave job uh, with some additional sidewalk and ramp work on the sides. Um, next one is North Pleasant Street from North Village. This is north of campus from North Village Drive to Fisher Street, which that's another mill and repave because um, it's still in decent shape, but it is starting to go in places. So now's the time to save it before it gets too, too bad to, to do a nice uh, rehabilitation on. Um, then West Bay Road, uh, that came up on street scan for um, rehabilitation, but we've got uh, larger plans for that, including sidewalks, crosswalks, um, some minor widening for bike lanes. So that one is going to actually be a full depth reclamation job so that we can widen out the road and, and get the revise the roadway profiles and stuff. Um, then the few last ones are some of the smaller ones uh, and they were some were listed for reclamation some for minor rehab but there were other factors that got worked into those like we, we know there's some sewer problems on Coles Road or oh, sorry Coles Lane downtown next to Brugger's um, as well as Webster Street we have a sewer issue we need to take care of and uh, so a lot of those we're actually going to take care of in-house and and we have a paving contractor we work with who can do some of these overlays after we do the underground infrastructure work so we'll probably handle some of those in-house which saves us a, a decent amount of money actually um, and did I oh I missed South Prospect Street and that's just a short little stretch from Amity to Gaylord we had done the other end of South Prospect Street a few quite a few years back because um, there was some talk about some parking changes um, so we had left that piece out but it's gone too far now so we need to sort of finish out South Prospect Street um, so that is our major paving list for this coming summer uh, and just below that in the blue is the Amherst Woods area where we have just well almost finished ripping it all up for sewer we've got probably a few more weeks this spring to finish out the sewer project in there and then we'll be beginning to repave some of the side streets off of wildflower um, and we're probably going to break that into pieces just so it's a little more affordable because it's a pretty big chunk um, and some of that work we'll be doing in-house other parts we'll be um, contracting out and then these ones on the bottom here um, were recommended for this year but there's some larger infrastructure issues um, needed. So College and Sealy Street um, both could use some sewer work. They were sort of working on uh, designs and discussions with Amherst College. Um, then uh, there's North Pleasant Street through campus, um, which we're sort of working on a larger plan with UMass to sort of get a cohesive design through campus on what we'd like to see for sidewalks, bike lanes, uh, bus pull-offs, and whatnot. Although they've done bits and pieces of it, we'd like to sort of do a, a more detailed look at the whole, the whole thoroughfare through campus. Uh, and then the one other piece is right downtown, North Pleasant from Amity to Fearing Street. And we've, uh, we, we've come to the realization that with our new budding downtown, we sort of probably are due for a sewer upgrade because it's a, a very old, very small pipe that currently runs down North Pleasant Street from here to there. It's a small six inch clay pipe. Uh, we replaced a portion of it last year from 
Halleck, well, sort of in front of the toy box down to Prey Street. Um, and we upsize that to a 10 inch pipe so just to increase capacity. And before we do anything with this section through the rest of downtown, we'd like to consider doing that as well, um, just for possible future expansions so that we don't pave it and then rip it up the following year. Um, so that is just the year one list. I go quickly through the years two through five. Um, I don't know if you if you just want to look at it, and I don't know if you want me to read it all off or just. I mean, we can take a quick look, and you can see that that you start off. So our first year is mostly rehab. There's very few reclaim, um, and then the second year you can see in red here. I've highlighted um, those are the ones that are reclaims, and they're all very short, small streets, but they're they're way overdue for it. They're they're PCIs. Um, quite low, they're in the 30s and 40s. We move on to a year. Can you explain the difference between reclaim and rehab? Oh, so yeah, so reclaim is when they take the entire road, the giant machine that chews the whole road back into gravel, um, and then they, they reform everything. And that that's usually when the road start to have all these ruts or giant potholes, and you see this just full sort of foundation failure. So you need to sort of start from scratch, rebuild from the bottom up, and, and do it all over again. Whereas rehab can be anything from like a mill and pave where you just take off the surface. You know, you still have a good roadway profile. It's still relatively smooth and, and, and straight, but it's just that surface layer that's failing. So you mill that off and then put down a new perfectly smooth top coat again. Um, so that's sort of the, the major difference between, there's, there's tons of other rehab methods, but that's our primary one, um, although we'll be trying a couple new ones this year. Um, so that's the, those are the major differences, and, and you'll see that you know the rehab streets we're focusing on are major roads. They're heavily trafficked, um, and then when we can and when it fits the budget, we're trying to do some of these smaller ones so that, that we know are due, but they just, they're not as high demand. So we do want to get to them, but we do want to make sure our major arterials are, are functional and, and we make sure we save them because they obviously, they're the longer roads, they cost more. Um, so we try to focus on those. So this is the year two where we, we have see a lot more major roads. And as we move on here, the major roads start to fall off and we start to be able to tackle some of the smaller side roads. Um, and we start to be able to tackle some of these, you know, smaller failing roads that we've, um, you know, been sort of deferring maintenance on for too long. Um, and then you get into year four and you see these, you know, this is almost all side streets here. And, and a lot of them are still okay and can be re rehabilitated. And so we're getting just a lot more bang for our buck, getting, getting the big ones out of the way. And then we can start to focus on some of these side streets, some of these residential streets. Um, and then we're into year five and we're almost entirely on side streets um, and, and more collector streets. So it's the, you know, as far as what, what we showed for our progress from when they scanned in 2015 to 2017, I think, I think we've been doing really well. Um, the, the one thing with this projected five-year list, it is, is, it is a $2 million budget and that's not what we get from chapter 90. Um, so we'd like to push for more. We know it's hard to find, but, um, and we've been trying to be very creative with how we find it as well, you know, incorporating all sorts of different budgets when we, like when we do sewer in Amherst Woods, that, that's paid for out of sewer. Um, so we are being creative with the budgets and trying to stretch our dollars, but um, it's, it's tricky to try and keep that PCI curve going upwards with uh, this only what we get from chapter 90. So I think that's the gist of everything. Okay. So I know I have several questions. I don't know if any of my colleagues do. So I'll, I'll go first. I assume that uh, going back to the front page of this list, <coughs> and I think you just hinted at it, but the reason these are in blue is the water fund actually pays for that. The sewer, sewer fund, correct. Or sewer fund yes. for those. Yeah, because those all like got dug water. up for sewer. <laughs> Um, they were also, several of them were on our worst in Amherst roads, honestly. Um, so they, many of these popped up 
Uh, I mean, if you look at the PCIs here, that you've got a 23, a 27, um, and then the others are in the 40s and 50s. So they were they were failing, and we were intentionally deferring them because we knew that the sewer was coming. So we were doing as you know, spending as little money on them as possible while trying to make them still passable. But um, we had been they'd been deferred for a while because of the sewer project. Um. This is a more general question. You know, uh, you did the mapping of the potholes last June. Um, <laughs> do you find that the where those are located, um, is there a correlation between where those are and generally the PCI grades, or is it more isolated failures of roadways, and so you see uh, certain small sections of a, a roadway that's that's failing relative to the entire stretch of a, of given of a given segment? Or is it a little bit of both, or I'm just sort of curious it's how those kind of fit together. Of yeah, it's a little bit of both. Um, sometimes it's just a single spot failure on possibly a perfectly good road, but but others it's a sign of a more you know more deep failure of a contiguous section. So I'll try to skim back to the map real quick. While you're flipping to that, um, so obviously uh, College Street has its set of them right in there that's a right fairly, and so then if i click back if we just pick that one piece and then i click back to the is this the pci yeah. yeah if we click back to the pci layer you'll see that yeah that stretch am i on the right stretch yeah that stretch of college street is yellow and it's in the 50s so it's it's at that point where it, it could use a mill an overlay if it goes much longer it might need more right um, so it is so, Relative to the PCI, you know, the numbers that you're showing on PCI is the, from the scan of last June. Um, I presume it's not a linear decline. Obviously, they're not going to go up unless you do work to them, so they're going to go down. Um, do you find that it is, and maybe that's why 55 is sort of the critical number on that earlier slide, as to once you hit 55 or below, that the, the degradation of the road is much more rapid at that point? Is that what it, you're finding it generally? Definitely is. I mean, that's when the road starts to crack, the water starts to get in. This winter, prime example, lots of rain, lots of freezing nights, and the pavement's just exploding in places that were in decent shape before. Not, and now they're not. But, um, but yeah, that's that's once the water gets in, um, that's the end of the road. Which is why we also from from the. Uh, maintenance list this map here um, we're trying to focus our crack sealing operations on some of these that are in pretty you know they may have a pci of like 80 which is in really good shape but it starts to show those surface cracks and if you don't seal them and if you don't get something down on those to keep the water out it just the decline goes so much faster which i mean it's just invaluable having a list like this with the maps we can hand to contractors or our in-house and and they can go out and and we prioritize them by with with the maintenance especially with the crack seal we sort of prioritize by best first because we want to save our more recent investments and and you know make those last longer um, because they, they will if you put them if like sal said if you put it down at the right time if you seal those maybe there's only five cracks on the road but if you seal those five cracks that mile of road it buys you another five years of pretty good road whereas if you just keep letting it go, letting it go. It, it just, it, like you said, declines much faster. Yeah, especially in this area with all the, with the winter and all the moisture that we get, it's, it's, it's really recommended to, to perform the, the crack sealing and, and preventive maintenance. Yeah. That's correct. I, one's a question and one's sort of a question comment. Um, route, route 9 is a state highway. But we maintain it because I know we were out patching. I saw people patching. Only Hopefully. Northampton Road. Uh, so only from uh, South Pleasant Street to the town line. That's the only portion Hadley. that is still state controlled. Oh. Um, College Street and Belgian <coughs> right. Town Road sections so, are all town. All right, so we own those holes. Correct. Okay. Yes, um, those are our holes. <coughs> those are our holes. <laughs> um, so looking at the five year list, I mean, I, I, and the bigger, sort of zooming out the bigger picture, so I get trying to keep the good stuff. <coughs> Good and where there's heavy traffic, and then trying to kind of in a methodical way get to the side streets. Right. And then I look at this and I think, well, that's great. Best laid plans of mice and people. Um, it, a lot of times, then something else goes, and you know, we get to year five, and and it's balancing those major roads and finally getting to the side streets. Because you know, as right. I talk to people, like 
They never, ever have come back and done my road. So how do you, not, given that not everything on here is going to work as planned and some right. other emergency road failures are going to pop up, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that you're always cycling in a fair amount of the side streets that are easy to, like, not do because so you can't get to them? That is the hard part. I mean, and years four and five are never locked in they they're they're almost never locked in they you know we try to scan every couple of two three years and and the priorities change every time we scan because some roads may deteriorate faster others may have held on better um and we can't always get to the entire list of what we should do for maintenance what we you know what we if we could crack seal that entire purple all the purple on that map it would be great but it's we can't budget for that either um, yeah. So it's tricky, and yes, years four and five are tough. Um, some of the stuff we're doing, like for example, uh, Belchertown Road, Route 9, we're, we're applying to the, the statewide tip to get on that repair list. It's just a question of how quickly they'll put us on it uh, once we submit that back in to the tip. So just, my, my, just one comment okay. on that, because uh, we have other clients that deal with this, is that the like now we have the data on your web GIS and just having the having pu public engagement because everyone thinks the road in front of their house is the worst but mm -hmm. when <laughs> when they look at the map they see oh that's why they are fixing that one not so that that usually okay. that strategy might help so yeah. that's a great segue my last thing um, so looking out to five years which is you know some somewhat best guess um, so I'm a resident say and I just picked this one it's not where I live but so I live on Summer Street, and I'm like wondering, well, when are they going to get to Summer Street? How do I find this list online? How do I know what you've got planned? How do I see, oh, oh, not, not to worry. In five years, they're going to get to me. I don't know that we have published it yet. We were, we were hoping right. to present to you first, right. obviously, but I think we can publish it at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see a problem with that. Um, just. I, I'd like to put a caveat in there that, you know, it, this is a $2 million a year budget, yeah. not what we well, get it, per year. It but. probably needs some contextualizing, but, <laughs> exactly. you know, you're right. People are going to go and look for their street, obviously. Right, right. Mr. Old. Yeah, thank you. This is very good. Uh, nice to see you both again. And this is have half a comment and half a question. I recall, for example, when I was in the Joint Capital Planning Committee, uh, Mr. Mooring came with plans to address Ms. Kruger's question. Mr. Mooring had plans, you know, he was saying we could do things like cul de sacs if they're close to something else because then we're saving time and so forth, as opposed to otherwise we're just redoing the main uh, arterial roads over and over again, never getting to them, which is what you asked about. But then there were, I think, quasi political decisions that said we're not going to do cul de sacs, we're going to do other roads. So that got, you know, what the plan that was developed by the professional engineers got changed for other reasons. So I don't know if that, that's, that's probably a factor as well in some of these things. Do, like if we are doing a main road and it's right next mm -hmm. to um, a side street that is failing, <clears throat> I mean, it, there's just a, there's an economy of scale right. where you've got right. all this equipment there already. It, it's a short cul-de-sac or, you know, and yeah. the main, you know, it's a, it's a minor percentage of what the main road would cost. We do try to sort of focus geographically and we've actually worked with StreetScan to kind of uh -huh. give us, you know, we want to do the best we can, but then if it's geographically mm -hmm. in, in proximity to something else that's being redone, then, then we try to uh, combine them in there. And I also, when we get the list from them, mm -hmm. I go through and I look at at least the next couple of years out, and I'll, I'll if I see something in year four that's right near something in year two that can need Great. as much attention, uh -huh. I, I bump them around. Mm -hmm. um, one example is uh, Pomeroy Lane oh, yeah. is coming yeah. up in a year or two, and I think, Pomeroy Court, which has had yeah. some flooding issues, yeah. um, was out in year four. <clears throat> so I, I grouped those two together right. because we want to take care of the flooding, the road, and, and mm -hmm. both roads while we're there. Second for the other question, I, I've been thinking about you guys a lot lately. <laughs> when I drive on West Bay Road and I see the sign saying rough pavement ahead, uh, you know, right there it's sort of delaminating. You've got huge areas, not so much big potholes, but just large strips that are down like an inch or two and so forth. I mean, large surface areas. Has there been inconsistent quality of the paving or is it about local conditions? I know we had problems, for example, with Sunderland Road, and we tried the, the new process for repaving right. years ago. So actually, West Bay Road was an in-house overlay, mm -hmm. which is at best a Band-Aid fix. Okay. Um, because you're waiting for the big... So because we were waiting for yeah. the bigger picture, and we knew, you know, we can't, we can't go out there every other day patching potholes. No. So we try to do, like, a nice in-house overlay. We try to make it stick as long as we can. Uh -huh. 
certain ones stick better than others and, uh -huh. and you know we are working on that but that was a pure band-aid and I we see. knew it was coming up so we we band-aided it and hoped it would last That's longer it. and it, Healing it, off. it is some of them uh, <laughs> pelham road i think is another example yeah. just yeah. like west bay um where we we've band-aided and band-aided they're, they're coming due So associated with the website, I wanted to comment, first of all, on how much we appreciate the really regular updates we get when the road work is happening and continuously encourage neighbors as they see things happening in their area. I subscribe to this. Do you subscribe to this so that you know what's going on? And so I think that those are incredibly helpful. So thank you for going to the extra work of getting those out to all the places the the chamber publishes it, et cetera. So that's really helpful. Um, when you decide what to put on the website, say under the project page, because mm -hmm. DPW has done project pages a whole bunch of different ways, I will just say you probably don't need this graph <laughs> for the average reader, just, you know. True. No, I don't think we'll put the whole presentation <laughs> For the in. engineering geeks, they right, would love right. it, but, yeah. Just for the good statistical but, stuff. The charts are very helpful that way, too. But, um, but as we, one of the criticisms we've faced in the past is that when we do say our priorities online, then they get changed, and the web page doesn't. And so that's right. the danger of giving people information as it becomes outdated. So just thinking when structurally, when you think about how do we want to put this up there and what's an easy way to fix it if it turns out we get this chunk of money or the weather right. goes this way or the contractors go that way, mm -hmm. we can just cross that section out and move on to the other because some way, in some ways people get their hearts set on something happening and then it doesn't for a whole variety of reasons right. and we say, well, we don't know. Um, why it's changed, so that would just be helpful to people. Mm -hmm. But something that's easy for you to maintain, because I realize it's a ton of information. Other questions or comments? Well, thank you both very much for coming and sharing the list with us and, and kind of giving us the background again and sharing that with the public as, at large as well. It's very helpful to us and, and uh, appreciate the work you do. And, and uh, I certainly, I was saying this to the manager the other day, I've been, you know, given the kind of winter we've had, which has been extraordinarily difficult for the roadways, um, I have to say I've been personally, you know, uh, pleased with the response time on, on you guys getting the things, because I understand it's, you know, I drive in one section of town, but I know that it's happening in all sections of town. And so when, when some of those more profound potholes show up and it, you know, within a day and a half or so, it's suddenly filled again, I appreciate that that's that's pretty you know uh a pretty good job of getting to them pretty quickly and i appreciate that and i'm sure drivers in town do too but it's never fast enough obviously but but you know that's you have your limitations on time and energy right. and effort and all that sort of thing but we appreciate what you do for I'll, us i'll pass that on the guys this winter have basically been taking the plows off the truck and going to get a load of asphalt right after so <laughs> right. it's plowing it up and putting it back exactly <laughs> it's gonna, it's been a winter kind of a, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Rotating door there. Thank you both. So next on our agenda, we'll go into uh, action and discussion item 4A, which is Shea Street School Zone and Crock Alarm School, which I think Mr. Morgan is going mm -hmm. to present to us. And we had a lovely pair of maps here. Good evening. Good evening. So, if you'd be so kind as to take us through the school zone request and the sidewalk lighting. Well, well, I'm organizing myself. A little final pitch. What you saw today was based on $2 million. <laughs> so if $2 million doesn't come, it doesn't all get done. So just the thing to remember. <clears throat> Good news for those who think we're not doing anything and just sitting there playing cards in the break room is the asphalt plants also are gonna probably start opening up this week. Wow. So we have one plant that told us they will be opening one or two days a week, depending on how the weather goes. So we'll be able to get more than just cold mix, we'll be able to get hot mix as well. We have our little machine that makes its own asphalt out. And we've been running two trucks every, well two trucks every day to get cold mix. So there's basically three groups out there patching right now. Um, and that's because the budget gave us enough money the last two years. Last two years we've been able to do this. 
if we don't have that extra money and we spend all our money paving in the summer, we don't have anything in the spring when everybody really, really wants it because they're tired of the potholes. So that's my public service announcement or uh, public service pitch. So um, on Shea Street, we got a call from the schools about looking into a school zone for Shea Street. And then shortly thereafter, we got a request from some residents about improving the traffic light, or the uh, crosswalk visibility at Shea Street and Went Wentworth, it's Went no, Wentworth Manor. <clears throat> I keep wanting to call it Wentworth Farms. That's kind of, I don't know why. Uh, so we actually had to look at both of these separately. Um, a crosswalk improvement is a crosswalk improvement. If the crosswalk had been closer to the school zone, we could have been able to lump these together. So we looked at the school zone, and there's never been an approved school zone on Shea, Shea Street for Crocker Farm. So we drew that up. It's in the drawing. This is a... Uh, This is the drawing for it. It kind of shows you the entrance for uh, Crocker Farm School. We're re recommending the school zones. This is the advance sign. This is the school zone sign. Uh, another school zone sign, advance sign. So we rec and that's with, within the standards of the manual for uniform traffic control devices. That's the guidelines we go by. There's a federal version and there's a state version. We both use both of those. So we found that the, it does qualify, and we do recommend you put a school zone in. Um, most of our school zones, when we put them in, we put flashing lights there. Um, but then when we got the request for enhancements to the crosswalk, which is just to the right here at Wentworth Manor, this little section right here, uh, we realized if we actually put uh, enhanced lights there, pedestrian activated lights, that we would have pedestrian activated lights and we'd have the school zone lights flashing and we'd have a little bit too much going on there. <clears throat> so what we came up with and we're recommending is that we you approve the school zone. You also approve that we put in enhanced pedestrian lights at the crosswalk. <clears throat> we only make the west crosswalk sign a lighted sign and the east sign is just a plain sign because you'll also have the crosswalk sign, I mean the crosswalk lights there as well. So during the school, school time when children are crossing back and forth, those lights will be going, so we didn't want to have the both lights going at the same time. So that's, that's our recommendation here. Um, it's a little different than normal because that crosswalk is so far, it's in the school zone, but it's not where it really, we'd really want to be in the school zone if we were doing it ideally. So any other questions? I'm, I'm still a little confused. Which We're talking about two different crosswalks, and I understand that. Which one has only the one blinking light and the one, is it the, the Wentworth Manor? The crosswalk road? at Wentworth, which is this crosswalk, <coughs> yes. that'll okay. have a light facing both directions. Okay. The school zone will only have a light at this end facing west. Oh, at that end. Okay. Yes. That says school zone. That's Correct. the school zone. Okay. So, um... On the material in our packet, it says proposed rectangular rapid flashing beacons. And I think I remember Mr. Skills talking at a meeting I was at last week that the rectangular ones aren't allowed anymore and they have to be round. So I guess we need a little update because regs are changing all the time. Well, if you actually read what's in the oh. mo in our recommendation, it tells you that it's... Uh, I did. Uh, um, Advanced warning sign. Approved pedestrian activated crossing lights in accordance with the manual uniform traffic control devices. So that covers both. It, it covers both. What we'll be but putting. It won't be the rectangular anymore. It won't be rectangular. It, it'll look allowed. exactly like the ones we have now, except it's going to be a round light up here at the top. Okay. Which is what the approved See, light I, is. I was paying attention. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a, uh, a bit of a. <clears throat> legal issue going on around the rapid, rap, rap, rectangular rapid flash and beacons, and the federal government has said you can't use them anymore until they resolve the issue. So we can't put new ones up. We can keep the old ones up until they fail or they get run over, um, and then we have to put up the circular light. Okay. Other questions? Yes. So, um, 
on the one hand, I'm always surprised we don't have more school crossing zones. We've done one quite recently at Fort River as well, and so I'm happy to see us go ahead and do this because it's obviously needed. At the same time, I'm wondering what the purpose of our TAC is if they didn't have any conversation about this, because that's where we're trying to send people is to the Transportation Advisory Committee. And if the better thing to do is to send people directly to DPW, or if this is an exception because it's a school, I would just like some clarity about what we're attempting to do with TAC, because I would. Mm -hmm. So my interpretation of TAC was not to be looking at school zones, that that really is the purview of the select board, that TAC would be looking at other items in terms of um, sidewalks and things like that. But in terms of whether there should be a school zone, it's a pretty um, formulaic thing. You can say, does it meet the requirements of a school zone or not? If it does, and for some reason this was never identified as a school zone until <coughs> The school department brought it to our attention and and parents who are walking to school were mm -hmm. saying why why is there a school zone on west street but not on shea street it seemed that then the question goes to the town engineer does should there be one there and if his answer is yes then he brings his recommendation to the select board it's really not a traffic issue it's more from my interpretation it's more does the select board want one there it, it seems to meet all the warrants for a school zone so to follow up and as I'd indicated, if we consider it separate because it's schools and it's safety and it's right away, I'm totally fine with that. But it's the Transportation Advisory Committee, it's not the Traffic Advisory Committee, Correct. and most traffic things are in fact ours, and none of them are going to get decided by the Transportation Advisory Committee mm -hmm. on its own. So that's why I want to continue to emphasize to people that they're out there, that they're working on figuring out a process mm -hmm. for people to talk to them, but you know, in terms of stop signs and that kind of thing, that is separate. In traffic and, and, and the way and you like are that. interpreting it, and I think you and I would agree then, that that is separate than the school zones, which hopefully now we've covered completely, um, associated with all the things we've been doing recently, but that other requests of this nature should go through the Transportation Advisory Committee so that they can figure out the larger picture, and obviously they're working directly with the DPW, and then eventually some things will get to us mm -hmm. from the Transportation mm -hmm. Advisory Committee and the DPW. Thank you. I could add on that, and I think maybe Mr. Moran can back me up. But I, I would, I know they've talked about school zones, as, you know, in a priority cri criteria kind of way. Not this. I don't know if they talk about this specific set of proposals, but um, I would imagine there's enough conversation back and forth between yourself as the staff, major staff person for the transportation advisory committee and um, the committee, so that you'd be able to update them on whatever action we might take tonight that wouldn't be like a surprise, like they'd be driving down Shea Street and all of a sudden, like, hey, where did that come from? Like, there'd be a way they would know what, they'd be in the loop. Correct. And, and most of the Transportation Advisory Committee right now is, is when they talk about school zones, they're talking about sidewalk priorities and, and bicycle priorities and trying to connect the school areas back to the village centers and so forth. And the the hubs and that's kind of where they've been focusing on with, with their discussions of sidewalks and bicycle ways so they're actually trying to figure out better ways and which areas should be improved for those types of modes of transportation so that's kind of what they've been focusing on when we, they talk about the school zones and their minutes if you read their minutes and I'm gonna say for the third time that if somebody wants stop signs or traffic calming they belong going to tack weather tax Correct. talking about things like bike lanes and sidewalks as their particular focus right now that's still where those requests are supposed to be going as i understand it okay thank you other questions so i believe we have a motion uh relative to the school zone and the uh, crosswalk lights if someone would like to offer that motion i can just because i I found it first. Um, I move to establish a school zone with school zone signs and advanced warning signs as shown on the plan identified as proposed Shea Street School Zone for Crocker Farm School dated November 22nd, 2017 with a Western School Zone sign lighted or lit and the Eastern sign unlit and to approve pedestrian activated crossing lights at the Shea Street in Wentworth Manor Drive, 
it says road on our map, crosswalk, all in accordance with the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices in the Massachusetts Amendments to this manual. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, no, that's unanimous. Thank you. Appreciate that. And so we move to our next agenda item, which is the secondary. Would it be so? Water it's not meters? a secondary water meter. I'm it's gonna, a second water meter. I'm going to tell the, the, yes, the, please, there. if you would be so kind. I know some folks are here and wanting to hear this conversation. So in your packet, you have the proposed regulations for agricultural meters. Uh, we chose to call them agricultural meters because we truly are, <clears throat> this is for agricultural use. It's not for a secondary meter um, for a house to water lawns or field pools or so forth. Um, we've, we're very clear and concise on what agricultural use is. That's in the definition sections and uh, what, the, what it is not. Um, we just really want to make this to address the issue that was brought up right now and only uh, that issue. So it's roughly um, two and three quarters pages is the uh, regulation we came up with. There is a one page form that we'll go through that will be used for um, <coughs> gathering information from the applicant for this and then the one page on the back side is for the DPW and the water guys to actually fill out as we go along and mark off the steps are complete. Um, I don't want to read the whole thing to you, so I, I'll just go for questions. Right. Were there questions from the select board regarding this? We've discussed it a couple times, but I didn't know if there were any particular things that jumped out at anyone that they wanted clarification on or <clears throat> anything of that sort. Why do I always go first? Okay. Um, just a few things, um, including we, we should, once we do this, we should date it. But I was, first paragraph, I was wondering when you list, this policy shall not apply to domestic, residential, commercial, or manufacturing uses. Is it worth adding recreational to that list? I don't know, because fields and, I, I, just a question. And then um, <clears throat> I was wondering, and I don't, maybe we had this before and I just didn't remember, why in order to meet the definition of agricultural use, you had to be in the 61A program or the APR program. I, I mean, can't you have an agricultural use that's legitimately agricultural and not be a participant in one of those two programs? Maybe I'll wait for that answer. So recreation, that's fine if we wanna, that would be fine to add that. Um, this was kind of the definition that was come up with and I think we ran this by the Ag Commission, or we didn't add it by the Ag Commission. I don't think they met. They, well, they met, Did but they, they didn't have the formal language. Oh. Okay. So it was a more general conversation than that specific. This was a more of a way to kind of um, narrow down the people who would be using it. Um, we don't want it to be a farm that's just growing flowers, or and they call themselves a farm. Um. So could I could I add to my yeah. so I un, it may be true that currently if there's only five potentially eligible farms and they all fall into that that's a convenient way to do it but I'm thinking we may have a new growth industry coming that has some agricultural products although not defined as agricultural um, exemption I'm, I'm thinking of um, the different ways of cultivating. Um, legal marijuana, and they may not be one of the five. And so I'd like to make sure that a legitimate agricultural use could be included in the agricultural meter bylaw without it having to be a 61A or a um, 
APR. That's it's just you know I don't. I'm, so you like a broader definition, I think. Yeah, I mean I wasn't part of the conversation that narrowed it, so I'm not sure the thinking. But I, when I read this, I was like, why so narrow? If it's re legitimately agricultural, not like fake uh, agricultural. If you go to the, if you go to the state definition, uh, the, me the medical marijuana is not going to fall in their definition as it's written. Other other things it, would, I, but medical marijuana will not. Right. It's not it's not considered an agricultural use, but I wonder if we might consider it agriculture for the purpose of the second meter or not. Maybe not. I mean, it's a different kind of enterprise. But I was using that as an example. But we might have another um, small farm operator coming in that we don't know about that isn't a chapter land or APRs. Mm -hmm. I, I just I asked that question. Um, I guess that was that was my main mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I let the other stuff is minor. So just to just to follow on that a little bit, what are the requirements to be in Chapter 61A? I know there's certain benefits to being in 61A as far as if you want to operate a farm. Just sort of what um, constraints does it place in order to qualify to be in that in that uh, 61A program? Do you know offhand? I mean, you may not. It's not. <laughs> It's not really my belly wick, <laughs> but do you have to? You do have to qualify for it. It's not. Um, I mean, your land isn't permanently in 61A. Right. That is. It's just a tax benefit for it, and right. you, yeah. and you do farm it. You have to meet those requirements. Um, there's 61A, which is farming. 61B, which is, is forestry, forestry, and there's a 61 recreational as well. Mm -hmm. So we only chose the the agricultural side, not the forestry or the recreation side. So I'm sorry if this was answered and I just didn't understand the answer. Um, I understand that AgCom didn't get a chance to look at the very specific detailed sentence, but are there not in fact farms that already exist in Amherst that aren't either of these things that we would consider farms that might potentially be this? So I'm just trying to understand if, you know, to name a few, Simple Gifts, Brookfield Farm, are they, is is every place they might want to do this already in that program? And so therefore, it covers everybody except for a brand new thing that we haven't heard of? Or are there smaller farms that aren't currently parts of those parts for some reason or another that I don't need to understand, but I don't want to exclude if we don't have to unless it helps us to define a group in a useful way. So uh, most of the large farms in town are, most of their land is in 61A. Most of it. If it's yeah. not, because you, you get the tax benefit for being in 61A if you're a farm. Mm -hmm. There are a few farms, there's one on East Pleasant Street, it's um, all the name, I had the name in my head, it just went out. It's a, uh, it's a, basically they grow mostly flowers and they might grow a few vegetables Stonehouse Farm. Oh, yes, Stonehouse. It is really like a B and B with gardens or something. Yes, but it's not a food production mm -hmm. garden, um, and that's a very small lot. It's less than it's, I think it's less than four acres. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a few of very small ones. Um, the ones we came up with, if you want, I'll read them to you so you can. So um, there's a Wagner farm on 305 Northeast Street, a Mitchell farm on Northeast Street, um, Small Ones Farm, Bramble Hills, uh, Amethyst Farm, which is also Mini Hands Farm, a Swartz Farm, Amherst College has the Book and Plow Farm, there's the Hampshire College Farm, the Brookfield Farm, Wysocki Farm, uh, Mitchell Farm, Delta Farm, J&J &J Farm, uh, Wysocki, Oh, sorry, Weinzig Farm, Mitchell Farm, and a Shawadi Farm. Um, there's also the possibility that uh, UMass is developing their little farm program on North Pleasant Street. Um, Simple Gifts um, is also one. Uh, Stone Free Farm, which is the one on Russellville Road. The Zala Farm on Sunderland Road and the uh, Poverty Mountain Farm in Shootsbury, which is actually all forested, but it's in, it had, um, I think, an APR on it is why it ended up in this list. 
Um, so those are the ones we found, which are more like what you would call, think of as a traditional type farm. Mm -hmm. And most of all of them were in 61A or mm. APR land. Most of them actually have the majority of the land in APR. Yes. Having heard that list since it wasn't provided to us in our packet, I think that I feel comfortable that we could go ahead if we feel comfortable with other parts of the policy with using that definition. And then if someone comes to us and says, mm -hmm. I'm different for this reason, then that doesn't mean we couldn't talk to them. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't just say, nope, don't read the letter of the law, I'm not going to talk to you. But that sounds like a fairly extensive list of the places that most of us perhaps think of when we're thinking of the different places this could include. To pursue that a little bit, I, I think hearing the list make, gives me some comfort, but um, somebody new to town who's uh, entering into mm -hmm. an agricultural business doesn't necessarily know that you just come in and ask for something and make your case. They're like, oh, nope, it's not allowed. So uh, my hesitation with this limit is somebody entering into agriculture, and we've given this break, I just don't understand why it has to be tied to those two categories. So, so we did struggle with the definition mm -hmm. and felt like what my feeling was, we wanted to tag it to something real that was a statewide thing. That was the easiest way because anybody can claim they're a farm and say, I'm mm -hmm. growing a tomato. Um, I consider myself of an agricultural use, and I have a pool that happens to be next to the tomato. But, um, so, you know, so to to me, it was like, what do we tag it to? That's statewide recognized. That's got a pre-ordained definition. Um, I understand what you say. Well, it could be someone else, and we could broaden the the board could broaden the definition. But at this go round, we said let's take something that that's tangible that everybody can know if it's yes or no, versus a definition that we were going to try to construct ourselves. Although, if you really are going, to, sorry, if you really were going to become a farm, and you would ask for the agricultural, the sixty-one tax break, mm -hmm. that would be something you would definitely ask for, because if you take land that's developable, mm -hmm. you're not going to pay as much as we'd like you to <laughs> pay full tax rate on it. You're going to try to make well, your. The, mm -hmm. I hear your point. Why? Why wouldn't you apply for it? Yes. Because it's only one tomato. <laughs> <laughs> and a huge swimming pool that you. <laughs> Other questions? I was going to make the same point. Let's say. So, so I think that the reason we we call it we call this an agricultural exemption because the purpose of this regulation is to encourage agricultural use in the town of Amherst. Mm -hmm. It's not a secondary water meter. We we had that conversation, and so no, we really the purpose. Why are we doing this? Because we want to, we want to encourage. The, those farmers and the, and the people who are operating farms to be able to more easily afford to be able to do mm -hmm. business in this town. But that is the intent. And just so you know, so the first six farms I read off are the ones who are being billed for water and sewer this time, if they use water. And there's um, only three possible additions to that list, which is the UMass farm, Simple Gift farm, and I believe the Zala farm. Those are the only three possible ones that have sewer adjacent to their properties that we would, if they asked for a water meter, we would charge them water and sewer under the current rules we have. Are there other questions? All right. Um, and I think I'll bring this up at the moment. So I will, uh, I will share with you at the Ag Commission meeting, um, we didn't have the specific language uh, available, but uh, the consensus of the group, they didn't take a formal motion, just it didn't work out that way, but because I did, they didn't have a formal thing in front of them, so I think that's part of it. But they were obviously in support of, of this because it does definitely um, support and promote agriculture within the town, and so they were definitely in, in favor of, of this, uh, this second meter for agricultural use. So I did want to report that out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, a second question that we discussed a little bit at the last time when we discussed this was about um, the sort of cost of, of implementation mm. um, and whether or not to um, 
to hold harmless those existing farms? Is there a way to frame that in such a way? Did we want to take up that? Did we want to, uh, given that there, the those that you listed have, have paid water and sewer for a number of, of years, did we um, collectively want to acknowledge that in some way by virtue of, of some holding them harmless in some respects relative to installation of a second meter if they chose to do that? If so, what would that would involve? How would we constrain it? We wouldn't want it to be a circumstance where that just went on in perpetuity because then we're doing things that, that uh, we wouldn't do for any other sort of new customer for the water. Um, so that wasn't included in this memo. I didn't know if you had any thoughts or, or information on that. Thank you. And I think of these as, I, I don't want to, I would think of them as two different things mm -hmm. as far as action by the board. That's not to say we wouldn't, wouldn't do both or won't do both, but I do think they're distinct pieces of the puzzle. Yes. Well, except that we, if we, Perhaps. <laughs> Let, let's look at the money first right. before we. So let me explain what you're looking at. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So at the top, these are the current water and sewer fees. If you are a resident and you want to come build a house in town and you're going to tap into the water main, you're going to pay $1,000 for your connection for water, $1,000 for your connection for sewer. If the town had gone through and put a water main in and left the stub of your lot, even though there was nothing there, you pay $2,000. You pay $2,000 for the water, $2,000 for the sewer stub we leave you. Um, if you have an existing water main that was there and the building was torn down and you want to try to renew that, it's $100 to try to renew either a water or a sewer stub. And then uh, your backflow device for a residential <coughs> house is $100. So those are the current fees we have. Um, and then we, I put the commercial fees just in case you were curious. And then there's a street opening fee at the bottom, which is $100 as well. So for <clears throat> the people who are in the sewer extension program, the sewer expansion program, the sewer line is free. They will pay the $2,000 to connect. They will pay the street opening permit if they, well, they don't have to go in the street. So they just pay the $2,000 if they're a residential lot. Um, they have to pay for all their plumbing changes in their envelope of their house and to get the sewer from the house to the stub at the street. So that's a cost that varies per house. That There's no real rule of thumb I can give you for that. It's just there's people in Amherst Woods who have their septic systems in their backyard. So they have to go inside their house, change the plumbing in the house, come out the front of the house, and then go <coughs> to the street. There's people in the Amherst Woods who have their septic system in the front yard. They just have to tear out their septic tank and plumb a little way to the street. They're much better off. So that number is there. Um, <clears throat> so if you take that as far as um, what I, we would propose is with the paragraph below, is that we give people until any of these six people, possibly nine people, uh, if they apply by July 1st and we approve that they are agricultural use, that the town will go in, and if they have a usable service, which doesn't need a lot of changes, we sometimes find services that are in very poor repair, and you can't do anything to them except replace the whole thing. Um, and that, for some people, that's a small job. For other people, if you're 500 feet back from the road, that's a large job. So if we find that the service is usable, we would propose that we would come in, we would split the service apart, we'd have a service that went to the domestic, uh, service that went to the agricultural use, and that we would install the backflow device. And then anything that is beyond the backflow device, which we consider during our survey to be a cross connection or an area of concern that could contaminate the water, that would have to be corrected by the property owner. Because once you get past that meter and in some of the larger farms which have piping everywhere, that could be a substantial cost to the town. So we could basically come in and set everybody up for business, the backflow, the new meter, and have it all set up for them, and then it goes from At no charge to the property owner. At no charge to the property owner. As long as the service is, reuse is usable. If the service is not reusable, then we can sit down and have a discussion with them about coming up with some way to make it usable and cost sharing or something like that. I don't mind doing that. 
So just a question in where it says proposal, the paragraph we're talking about, it says um, for meters approved before July 1, the town may waive the requirement to connect, so I'm wondering what will waive, may waive. I understand there's some caveats because of cross connection and if it's a mess, but how do we give some <coughs> surety about what if you what say, will be waived and what won't be waived? Because may waive is a little vague. If you accept it, then it would be waived. Will waive, shall waive. Will waive, okay. Shall, right, because that's- Shall. Right. Shall is the more legal, yeah. That's so okay. okay. Much clearer. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions regarding this component of of the conversation? Is it in our motion? I think no, it's a separate motion. motion. No. Just, Would, uh, yes. So with, without getting into actually designing a system, which I don't want to do, <laughs> I just want to understand flow <laughs> of the wording. And so I get the part about waiving the requirement to connect to the water main if an existing usable service is available and will pay for the installation of the backflow prevention device. Because otherwise, the sentence implies that there are other costs that are going to be borne, even though we just said waive. So is it not, is it not accurate to say is available and the town will pay for the installation of the backflow prevention device, period? No word only because only implies there's something else they're going to have to pay for, which I know they may have to pay because the usable service, this may not, the service may not be usable, and that's the more extensive conversation. But if it's straightforward, it's that the town shall waive the requirement to connect to the water main if an existing usable service is available, and the town will pay for the installation of the backflow prevention device. And Does that make sense? For. And pay. will pay, yes. Mm -hmm. We keep making it shorter, yeah. I feel like I'm in that movie, uh, River Runs Through It, where the guy's sitting with his dad, and his dad says, too long, shorten it. <laughs> <laughs> too long. Applicant's responsibility should probably be um, in a possible possessive. Yeah. possessive. Right. Okay, well, you get that. As long as we're messing, because this probably is going to be the, most, the second the right. right. spelled too. So are there questions regarding either part of this that we've been discussing this evening? Is it time to hear from the It is. Are there people in the audience that wanted to comment or I don't come up? I don't know what the proposal is the actual what you're doing the numbers. Oh, do we have any? Come forward. So at Tell this, us who you are. Oh, right, at home. Ronnie Wagner, part of the farms on Northeast Street. Um, so right now, you guys are saying that there would be no charge unless it's overly complex. Like this is what you're proposing. Um, if it's just installing the back meter, there would be no charge to the actual property owner. What did you guys conclude about or propose about the maintenance fee annually? I know that was discussed at the last meeting. So I think that um, the year-over-year, -year, there's a there's a year-over-year -year backflow inspection, I guess, is test and inspection that would be. Um, Mr. Morgan, did you have a number on the cost for that? Memory serves, it's like 35 to $50 was kind of the number I remember, but I may have misremembered. I don't think it's in the memo, this memo, last time we talked about it. Yeah, it's, it's 30, it's... Hi. Hi. <laughs> see you again. Look at <laughs> it is $35 for one type of device, and another device is $50. Right. And who would be responsible for that with this right. So I think that was part of the conversation we were going to have tonight in some respects, I think. Um, do any of my colleagues have an opinion they want to offer at the moment regarding that? Um, obviously, when, you know, if you had the service installed, you'd have a year before that would come up as a, as a cost for the business. Um, I don't know. I'm, 
of an opinion that that's a bit of the cost of doing business to some extent, but I don't know if my colleagues feel the same way or not regarding that. Um, but I'm open to hearing what other. I'm, I'm making an assumption that because it wasn't in the proposal, um, that whatever kind of staff level discussions happened to prepare this for us, that um, it was a disinclination to add the annual fee, and I am disinclined as well. Yeah. I, I think the concern that we run into is because it gets a lot more complicated in a hurry, is one thing I think about is, so for example, the current owner of the farm has this you know, uh, particular benefit, let's say, of a, you know, covering that cost of, of that backflow. Um, but then they decide to not be in farming, and either their heirs decide to be in farming. Does it go with the property? It's one of those things like a deed restriction. Does it become grandfathered indefinitely on that piece of property, and then what happens if the property changes? And so it gets a really complicated in a hurry if it's something in perpetuity because of the land ownership may change in ways that we can't anticipate. Um, I mean, that's the sort of complications, I think. And, and again, I, um, it is, you know, sort of part of the, uh, I think of it a little more as a cost of doing business, and that's not to say it's, you know, it's not free, obviously, and, and it is a burden to the, to, to, uh, to the farmer. But I, it, I think it gets complicated down the road, not in the, and it, is, it becomes a permanent cost for the, for the, for the town to take on, um, and it you know may or may not uh, you know if 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 the circumstance is such that the business doesn't you know doesn't stay as an ag business then becomes back into being an ag business you know does it still qualify for that or not I, that's where I think I I struggle with it a little bit because it becomes you know currently the the suggestion we have is for the installation, and so that's a that's a one-time beginning sort of cost, um, and then uh, whereas that backflow, you know, sort of testing is a is a year-over-year -year thing, and that's where I think it gets complicated with regard to um, the long-term horizon and and you know, change in ownership, change in land, change in all sorts of things like that that get a little harder to to kind of stay fair with what happens um, because the thing, you know, a new a person buys a new piece of property somewhere else in town that's not on town water and decides to make it a farm. Um, you know, obviously they wouldn't get the benefit of this, but would they get the benefit of not having to pay for that backflow testing? I don't know, you know. So I, I just, I see it as a complication that, that's difficult to resolve well and fairly over a long period of time. So that's, that's my complication with it, but I don't know if my colleagues have any other comments on that. So I would I would like some more information from Mr. Mooring to help provide some context, which he's which he's done here with some numbers, but again, trying hard to understand as only the very basic that I have to understand to make this work is that, you know, we talked about the residences that are going to be connecting to the sewer due to the expansion, and so that's a you know, $2,000 connection fee we talked about and how complicated their plumbing is going to be in various situations, and if they're residential, they're paying $100 for a backflow device. Yet, for commercial, they're paying 500 for a backflow device. If we could get a little more information about what the value is that we are already offering here with the proposal as shown. And then the second part of the question is what happens if when it comes time for the first inspection, the, um, they don't pay the inspection fee? So those are my questions. Mm -hmm. So the so the value <clears throat> I can't really give you an actual number. Right, but I can give you what there's a there's a device cost. The device a backflow device that a farm would use is actually substantial. It's a, it's expensive. It's probably in the order of several hundred dollars in the three hundred dollar range just for the device. Okay. Um, that that's what that would be. Um, <clears throat> how the house or how the existing service is plumbed and that that's all based on the survey we do inside the house. I mean, if it's an older facility and it's it's a galvanized service, 
um, that opens up a whole ball of wax where the galvanized service may not even be able to, we may not be able to cut it apart and do the, the changes we need to make. Hopefully it's a uh, pretty up to date. It's got, it's a copper service. Um, I actually didn't look at what your farm is. Um, so if it's a copper service, it's easier to, to change and rearrange things inside the, inside the service. Um, so you'd have a, you could have a residential meter and you can have the sag meter side by side with the backflow device, meter backflow device. Um, so that would be relatively inexpensive except for the, the backflow device. So it's hard to say that. Right. And if they do not pay the fee for inspection every year, it's a failure by the state law and we have to shut off the service. Okay. Thank you, that's quite straightforward. Yeah, the state kind of told us that this yeah. very clearly. So is there further questions or comment relative to these items? If not, I would entertain a motion on either. Can I read you one more little statement? That I sure, yeah. please. Okay. Thank you. Just to Change leave it before you vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically, thank you again for having the discussion about the agricultural sewer rates in Amherst. Um, as a reminder, this has been presented to the current assistant town manager, the select boards, and ag commissions for over a decade. Installing the secondary meter and assigning any financial burden to the property owners holds no legal merit. Does it do away with any of the monies that were illegally collected from services not rendered? So once again, as we originally discussed, I mean, we'd like to implement the ag exemption. Um, for the existing farms as far as future farms like you said potentially grandfather them in who knows but once again I'll remind you that those future farmers I mean new property owners I'm not saying heirs I'm not saying inheritance didn't have to suffer the burden of giving the town money for something that they didn't do um, so once again we're kind of from the farmer standpoint, and I apologize, I didn't know the Ag Commission had met to discuss this, um, so I was not present at that meeting. I don't know what discussion was had. Um, but lastly, I mean, if you compare even the $30 every month that you would be charging for a farmer to have the inspection, considering the thousands and thousands, over $10,000 over 10 decade, or over the decade of the money that you've already collected, once again, why is it fair for the farmer to have to continue to pay. Yes. So I, um, I'm happy that we're making an effort to address this issue. I think it will be more fair and promotes our values of promoting agriculture going forward. Um, to put too fine a point on it, but I really, you may disagree with the past policy, but to say that it was illegally collected is not accurate. It was not illegal. It was w within the scope of the law. And so I think an accusation that we were doing an illegal practice is something that I would want to correct. So you may have disagreed with the practice, but it was a legal practice. We're now doing a remedy to um, reflect current thinking. I mean, and, and I'm not trying to constantly debate and argue, but in my stance, it's not just an opinion. I mean, I don't understand how legally it was merited to do that. Like, nowhere has it been explained that it's okay to charge for sewer that you're not using. I mean, I don't get to charge for stuff I don't produce. I think it's, it, it's really probably, and I don't know how much, you know, how state law works relative to water and sewer services in towns. It's part and parcel of how that law currently is constructed at the state level, I think, that allows, uh, you know, communities to, to charge for that, even though that you weren't taking advantage of it. Um, you know, you know, the sort of plain reading of it is, is fairly clear, and I think that's part of why this select board has been uh, interested in taking action on it because the, like you say, the sort of plain reading of it is is such that you know it doesn't seem very fair. But at the same time, I think, um, you know, 
was allowable under the law as and and was you know uh practice of the town and i presume depending on how we <laughs> vote tonight will not be the practice of the town after that but but i think that that's um you know sort of a quirk of state law in some respects with regard to that but um so um two things one is if we could have clarification from mr mooring associated with how often this inspection is because now i feel like i'm hearing both month and right. annual yeah. it's <clears throat> depending on which device you have uh-huh there's two types of devices i won't confuse you with the names they confuse me Thank you. One device has to be inspected semi-annually, so that's twice a year, and that's the $35 fee, I believe. Oh. And one device is inspected once a year, and that's the $50. Oh, okay, so that's 50 yeah, that or, or, se or 70. So it's 50 oh, or 70 yeah. is what it comes down to. I didn't get that either. Right. Okay. So okay. The, I assume they're going to get the bigger device, which is going to be once a year you inspect it because the <clears> the use. The smaller device, which you inspected semi-annually, is a, a small device, and it's it's um, for restaurants. It's yeah. By nature, it has more of a failure rate Not because it is a smaller device. <laughs> the larger device is much beefier, it has a much more reliable, much more reliable. It's used mm -hmm. in bigger applications. Thank you. That's helpful. And also. Um, I'm going to come back to the money in a minute, but in terms of, as you had written this, Mr. Mooring, for us, um, when you said for agricultural meters approved before July 1, would there be a problem with saying applied for prior to July 1? Do you feel the need to get this all done in a particular time frame? <coughs> Just from the standpoint of people may have more research they want to do this being February and thinking if they just applied and again that would be the deadline you know it wouldn't be that you know five more farms some other day would ask for this but we uh, we kind of felt that the farmers would come in and want to be done by June or May because okay. because of the mm -hmm. season start, they start watering yeah. pretty early and right. it's okay. important to water mm -hmm. when they're at but, that point so we figured everybody would come in really quick about this but, by July everyone mm -hmm. That might would, be an issue to water. It would point. give more flexibility. The reason I, I want, I just want to give the flexibility in case we have trouble getting it approved prior to July 1st, even though they've applied prior to July 1st, because I know things get complicated. No, we, you can, I'm happy if you say that, but it's pretty much if someone comes in, we're going to probably do it the next day. We're going to start talking to them. That's very helpful. Thank you. Then I have a follow-up question associated sure. with the fees. So um, it is complicated for all the reasons we talked about. The only possible thing I could see associated with the inspections is the possibility of waiving the first inspection but fee, not the inspection, but the first inspection fee. I can't imagine doing it beyond that, and that perhaps gives, again, some feeling that it's not a huge amount of money. It's more a uh, recon recognition of this particular subject in this particular time. I don't want to fight about it, but that seems like a way to do it. I'm not comfortable with saying for X number of years or until the next owner or until or something else changes or forever. Um, but a one, just like this is a one-time offer for installation at, at no charge, although the policy will be ongoing. Right. in terms of this particular, this separate issue, as you say, is separate from the policy. The policy would be in effect anyway, but in terms of this price proposal, this would be associated with one time and then potentially one time waived inspection fee, but only the first, again, if it's twice a year. If it's the $35 one, then that gets more complicated, but because that's twice a year, and so in terms of saying first, but the first years of inspection fee, I don't know. I'm starting to feel like a car advertisement or something. <laughs> and then 0% <zero> down. <laughs> <laughs> right. So how about if I make the easier motion? Okay. And then we'll, we're going to, if we get into rates or fees tonight, we're going to need a motion anyway. So you could draft it that way or somebody could. So you want to the one about the reg? Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I have changed it a little bit from our um, motion sheet. But... Um, I move to establish regulations relative 
to water meters for agricultural use as shown on the policy and regulations for water meters for agricultural use dated February 20th, 2018 as amended, and I would like the date, that's the end of the motion, I'd like the date to be under the title and not on a footer on the second page. Uh, but that's the motion. Is there a second? Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Oh, you've got <laughs> get somebody out there. Yes. Some more. So you're accepting the definition as it is here is what you're saying. Okay. Did you want to add? And, well, the as amended was adding the word recreational. And we're adding recreational to the. Did you want to add recreational? Yes. Yeah. And uh, we're adding recreational After the to word commercial? commercial, recreational, or manufacturing uses. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. A few other corrections. We'll let them go. And then okay. the date in two places under the title, okay. voted, you know, such and such, and then also in the footer. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Because footers change. Yeah. Right. But saying voted, not just mm -hmm. date, oh, which voting. could be the date that it was given to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So voted 226. But Someday we'll have a template for such things. It's okay. <laughs> I just didn't like the draft dated. Yes. Yeah. Right. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous with one person absent. So on the other component piece, did someone want to offer a motion relative to that? Um, I could try and read it. Let's uh, give it a shot. Okay, so let's try it this way and see what people think. I move that for agricultural meters, or agricultural water meters, should have water. For agricultural water meters applied for before July 1st, 2018, the town shall waive the requirement to connect to the water main if an existing usable service is available and will pay for the installation of the backflow prevention device. It will be the applicant's responsibility to address any cross-connection issues beyond the backflow prevention device and to pay the necessary inspection fees. Oh, you're not exempting the first year? Um, I'm open to discussing that. I just want to make sure we address the inspection fees somewhere in here, okay. whether we do it or not. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. Yes. Okay, just um, in that first sentence, when for agricultural water meters Here's applied for before July 1, 2008, yeah. the town shall waive the fee requirement to connect? Mm. Yes, um, right, because I was reading yeah, that and I was like, connect, wait, yeah. they kind of, the whole point is to connect. <laughs> connect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so there's a bunch more changes. Shall waive the fee requirement, thank you, to connect to the water main. Well, wait, because they are connecting to the water main, which would normally cause a fee. There's See, this is the whole, I don't want to understand how this works, but you're going to have to tell me something. You're waiving the fee to connect, yes. yes. So that word was yeah. just missing. That word. Waiving the fee requirement. It, 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 makes, it, it makes more sense to say it that way, even though I didn't write it that way. But listening to your talk, it makes more shall sense. Shall waive the fee to connect, not the fee requirement, the fee to connect. Right. Yep. Waiving the Better. fee, not the requirement. Yes, exactly. Same That's thing. where we were getting hung up, is Same the requirement thing. is the whole point. To Shall waive the fee to connect to the water main if an existing usable service is available and will pay for the installation of the backflow prevention device. The applicant's responsibility to address any cross-connection issues beyond the backflow prevention device and to pay necessary inspection fees. That's um, the current motion. You can leave the last part off about inspection fees because when we do it, we would have to pull the permits so we would pay the fees anyhow. Okay. Okay. Okay, but uh, um, so you're talking about the annual inspection. Yeah, different, different oh. than this. I'm talking about the the other inspection. Like that phase. would be another. Whole um, other we can do that as a separate sentence if you'd rather. So we could just end it at backflow Why don't we prevention vote that device. Separately? Mm -hmm. Why don't we do that as a separate yes. motion? Yes. Okay. Even though it's <clears> beyond <throat> the backflow prevention device. Period. So How does that work? 
And there's a second. Second. Okay. Is there further discussion? So I think we're clear on what we want. I think we're confident with, with what we wanted for this, and then we can have the separate discussion Mr. about. Mr. Buckelman, did you get all that? Yes, I did. Okay. We no further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. And so, do we want unanimous? Did we want to entertain a motion relative to the first or subsequent um, inspection fees for meters installed prior to July one or applied for prior to July one, twenty eighteen? Or not, or I don't want to fight over or die over this, but I have the same thought as Ms. Kruger that if we're going to, we're, we're trying to do the right thing and correct what was an awkward situation before that was not of our making, and then to be told we're doing things illegally and will be seen in federal court, I mean, I'm not terribly sympathetic. But that was, that was one applicant who did that. That was one applicant. All applicants will be. But I hear your sentiment. Did you, you look as though you might have a comment of some sort or some <laughs> clarifying bit of information to share with us? It's um, it's totally your call how you wish to do it. Um, if you were to say that the it's waived until the property is transferred outside the is sold, um, we live with that. That's fine. If we say it's only for one year, two years, five years, we live with that. So, from the standpoint of making it work, don't take that as being your driving factor. It, I'm, I'm trying to relieve one of the issues that, uh, mm -hmm. so that's that's all I have to say. If you decide you want to make it, it just is something we have to do. It's something I wouldn't like to do routinely, but I understand you're in a position and that you may need to have to make this decision. And however you make the decision, if you decide something, we'll make it work. Um, so don't feel you have to do something because you think we can't make it work. Okay. Thank you. That was incredibly helpful, thank you. And so, um, because I know that actual implementing of things is often way more complex than anybody wants to think about, except the people who end up having to do it. Um, I would move and see where it goes, that we waive, what, what would you refer to this inspection fee as so as not to confuse it with the permit fee? Uh, so this is, the, this is the required backflow device inspection fee. Could, could you add annual? Oh, it's, oh, it's semi-annual. Semi yeah. semi Sorry. Required backflow inspection device. The first fee? Backflow device inspection. <laughs> backflow device <laughs> inspection backflow fee. Backflow prevention. Prevention backflow device. Backflow prevention device inspection. inspection. So what I'm trying to get at is the first year's worth of fees. Mm. Is the first year or the first fee? It's the first year's worth so of fee because two. we don't so want to encourage anyone. Yeah. We want to, you know. First year is no better. Taking right. the pain because away from one year. But you also want to qualify it for those that have applied previous to July 1, 2018? Yes. Because otherwise it's a perpetual. Exactly. <laughs> right. For those exactly. who applied prior, for, for the um, meter prior to. It's, it's really just an additional sentence if we approve it as opposed to being a completely oh, separate so you move concept. As part to amend yes. this to add that. Yeah, that's a good way of doing it rather than pretending it's a completely separate thing because then that covers the July 1st mm -hmm. part, that it only applies to this so, limited set of circumstances. Okay, so adding a sentence, we're amending the whole motion and adding, can you read it again, please? No. I absolutely cannot. And to waive the first year, the first year's um, inspection fee for the required backflow prevention device. device. Yeah. Okay, so I second that okay. amended motion. <laughs> Whatever it was. I think this is being videotaped, so you can replay this about eight <laughs> times to get it right. And that's going to—that's an amendment to the previous motion that you just approved. So right. all the all the other language the same, plus this is another motion. Right, and that that being my point is, so we didn't have to go through the explanation again of how it's right. applied for right. by July first. Yeah. It's only for this limited yeah, subset, it's so it's covered. a limited time offer. It's small print, um, and then it will be over after this set of people apply. By July 1st, 
and then get them installed, get their first year's worth mm -hmm. of inspection fees waived, and then it this will be like it never happened because mm -hmm. moving forward, everyone will be subject to Whatever all the, the normal fees. charges and fees mm -hmm. and annual or intermediate yep. to connect. And I do feel like, dis despite the frustration that's been expressed on a couple of occasions here, that it does fit in, it's, it's a relatively small amount of money, and it does fit in with our values as supporting the agricultural nature. As you said originally when we wrote this, we wanted to make it really clear that we're encouraging agricultural use, not that we're just looking at a second meter sort of situation. And so in support of that is, is where I'm coming from associated with that, even though it doesn't benefit every farmer, but it benefits this small subset and, and seems to be the overall process of what we're doing with all these words is going to be a substantial benefit to them over time, which is a good thing and we're happy about that. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Unanimous. Can, can well. that do away with the shorter version of this in the minutes <clears throat> so that the minutes can just be the one we just amended and not have it? I think late. we would have had to. We did amend the first one. It'll be fine. Okay. We don't. Just think <laughs> Robert's <laughs> rules, all He's of a sudden. Good. I just like, yeah, yeah. Go um, what? <laughs> Could we have, if, if we're done with Mr. Warren, can we have a short break? Absolutely. So thank, thank you, you very much. We appreciate you coming in, spending some time with us. Thank you, Mr. Skeels, as well. We'll take a short recess. <laughs> because we've been all over the place. I know. So. <laughs> I think we're getting there. I'm going to roll the dice and just pick stuff. <laughs> the best laid plans. Oh, well. Although we're pretty far along, quite frankly. You know, I mean, it's that's I think why the state law has that sort of well, it makes sense. No, I thought you explained it well. I'm talking about state law because I think our even our regulation does. Right. And you know, it, well, one of the things that complicates the bill. Yes, I can imagine. You know, you know, yes. if you think about a small yes. water service. That, yeah. You know, I mean, we're big enough that it's we're right. able to more easily than others are. But if you think about, you know, if you live in, I mean, Hadley, I mean, he's got a well there. They may have yeah. water service. You know, that's right. By, yeah, but I mean, there are towns that are the smaller size right. that don't have the sophistication to do that kind of building. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's an undue burden to mm -hmm. try to sort that out. Right. You know, you get into the, the pelons and the, you know, and you have other people that are just on sewer. Yeah. I don't know how we yeah. know those people, they're just on sewer. Yeah. Like, if you have a well, but you're on sewer, it's like, yeah. Because we're, we're on water, but not sewer. So that's See, the thing is, is, when you're on water, yeah, and your sewer bill is based on how much water, water you yes. There's a lot of but if you're just on sewer, sewer I didn't they, ask that question. I'm kind of glad I didn't because I don't know what they do. And we're the sewer commissioner, so right. we should know. But I don't know how they bill for yeah. people that are just on sewer. Maybe That's there isn't an interesting question. Because yeah. Yeah. if you were, you know, because you could legitimately be just on sewer and put a well in your backyard because you want your own well or 
yeah. you collect rainwater or whatever it is you yeah. want to do. Yeah. You know, you can, I don't know how they would, because you really get a bargain then. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I'm hooked up to water, but I use 10 gallons a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and our water's, actually our water's cheap too, you know, compared to most places, so. Yeah. Sorry. It's just, yeah, I mean, I get, I, I mean, you know, like I said, there's multiple ways to argue the, mm -hmm. the point. And I don't think, you know, it's kind of like when Connie brought up the you, know, mm -hmm. you get the same sort yeah. of round around about whether benefit fees are fair or not fair. Yeah. Or not fair. yeah. Cool, man. Right. Not cool little pieces of illegal activity. No, and then the heck with the back of the room. Yeah, but she did what she wanted. We can take it, but why? <laughs> <laughs> like We're, still We're, still on. On. We're still on. We're still on. Where's my dental appeal board? File? Edit. Yes, file. Oh, that, that, that was a work of art. You mean your work of art? Yes, exactly. My beautiful work of art. From yeah, I don't time. think I brought that. Nobody ever keeps the old stuff because then I would actually be a little bit No, I, I, I kept that and I shared that to Guilford, whoever was right. No, Rob Mora. All right. So, are we yes, we're about back. ready? Sorry, no, that's all right. So next on our agenda is uh, action discussion item 4D, which is the Rental Appeals Board. Mm -hmm. And we have two pieces of work under that, the charge itself and the special municipal employee status. And I believe we had in our packet. Yep. That's it. Things that capture some of that. Sorry. Want to paint a picture for sure. us? So uh, last week you talked about the Rental Appeals Board and you had a rough um, charge and you made some comments and we took those comments back and tried to incorporate them. Uh, and the second thing that you identified is whether these employees would be um, receive special municipal employee status and so you have a list of all the special employees status um, positions since 2007 and you have two motions to approve or the, the charge if you want unless you want to make changes and to uh, grant the rental appeals board special municipal employee status and again this is the board that would get together if someone had an appeal of the rental registration bylaw and the board concludes the chair of the select board, the chair of the planning board, and the chair of the zoning board of appeals, whoever ha happens to occupy those seats. It's so pretty. There you go. So I was thinking about the term of appointment for three years, but then I realizing that the designee may be the person that needs to have a three-year term. It, maybe it doesn't need the other folks. It's actually not inside. supposed to have a term on it. it does not that need to have the, that. That was the intention is that it was going to be something it different. Doesn't it doesn't fit in with with all of our other things. No, whether or not with the designee, though, whether we would have that as a, a limit. Obviously, with, with elected officials, they have, you know, <laughs> they have to get reelected. Um, other people have to get reappointed. So. And get reappointed. But you just have no... Because it's a, because it travels with the position, you would not. I guess you would no not term. have any term. You don't have any term, and so the term of appointment so is actually not supposed to be on there, just as it wasn't on there to begin with. And what is supposed to be on there is very helpful. Has the annual town meeting um, piece. It has special municipal employee, assuming we vote that. But it also doesn't have the um, the fact that it's an ongoing commit. I forget what we've tried to phrase that at one point, but it's Perfect. as opposed to uh, you know a time limited committee right. like downtown parking working group for example, which we may renew, but at this point is a is a time limited thing. This is an ongoing, but ongoing may not be the word that we're looking for, but that's the best I could remember from what I said the last time. So um, type 
some people use the term ad hoc, some people use task force, et cetera, but what I was trying to get at was um, ongoing. So mm -hmm. I'm happy if somebody can come up with a different word, but ongoing is versus time limited. So permanent. Sometimes it's called <laughs> standing. Standing. Because standing, they I like exist, that. But they're not doing work until right. they have to. Right. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah, standing is good. very nice. And. In the mode of making things up as we go <laughs> <laughs> we're doing an awesome job and so we remove the term of appointment and then my question is associated with the chair's reference do we to, do we want to clarify that it's now that i'm reading it again in a slightly different format um that it's chairs yes. of the select board mm -hmm. planning board yes so it's always the chairs unless they send somebody else Designate. Other edits. Should we? Uh, I guess we have to approve the charge and then the SME. Mm -hmm. That's the right order of events. Mm -hmm. Usually, what yes. we do. <laughs> it says yes before we voted the second one. It's one of those chicken and egg kind of problems. But anyway. Yes, it is. So, if there are not other edits that people can think of, I would take a motion. Um, 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 somewhere here. Is that motion sheet? Yeah. The to adopt the Rental Appeals Board charge as amended. Second. And there's a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. Right. Aye. Aye. And that's unanimous. And so. Second piece would be this special municipal employee status. Do you want to do a little quick reminder to the general public about that, Ms. Brewer? As far as what no. that uh, <laughs> That's why there's all this material in here. <laughs> but there is a fairly lengthy description of it in our packet. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So basically, if you're on if you're on a committee, you can't ever, unless you have special municipal employee status, you really can't represent to any other committee. And so if you're someone who has, in normal cases where we worry about is you're someone who has clients in town that you might need to represent before another board. And this is somewhat different because it's already chairs of boards, but it seems just more appropriate to go ahead and call them special municipal employees so that no one has any confusion about the fact that they're supposed to be serving multiple roles. Would you like to make a motion? I move to grant the Rental Appeals Board Special Municipal Employee status effective immediately. Second. Is there further discussion? Well, just to add for people who might not know, and I, I, um, what Ms. Brewer said about Special Municipal Employee, um, because our conflict of um, interest laws are appropriately strict, um, in either status, that member cannot present in front of their own board. But it's like if you were a totally unrelated matter before, say, the AGCOM, right. if you didn't have the SME status, you could potentially be in, in conflict. So it, it's very broad, and this allows, especially in a smaller community where people do wear multiple hats. Um, but just to be clear, you, you still can't for your own board. Right. Which is just complicated because it, it's not the same as doing the work of your own board in this case. Yeah, right. And so, whereas the example you gave is entirely appropriate for other bodies. So, it's an odd sort of situation, but it seemed better to go ahead and squeeze it under SME than to not. This community, this uh, variations of the select board have over time pulled in and expanded the number of committees that are covered by SME status and I am always in favor of expanding the number because it encourages participation by more members of our community and there are still very strict rules and people if they ever have any question there are people who have thought about applying for committees who have said I may have too many clients here where I may end up with a direct interest and therefore I still wouldn't be able to do it even with SME status so I just wait until I'm retired or I change jobs and and that's entirely appropriate so um, thank you I think that makes sense for the discussion 
And so would it make more sense, however, instead of saying effective immediately, which I guess I've never done before, we should go ahead and say effective now because- You said in, that in your motion? Yes, um, 226. 18 as opposed to immediately because the the odd thing is we're, we're not having to make the separate step of appointing people usually we approve the charge and then sometime later we appoint the members in this case we're done already right okay. so effective immediately or 226 whatever works okay it, it'll be effective after tonight <laughs> right, right, right exactly right. but if you if the rental appeal board had to be called together tomorrow and we should make sure that on the bottom of the charge it shows what date we voted the charge because again, footers change and we don't have a particularly permanent um, template associated with committees. So we say the date we approved the charge was 226 and the SME is also effective 226, whereas that has not always been the case. There have been charges that are much older right. that then get SME status much later. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that you is. Thank you. All right. So take care of that. Um, so I think next yours, we have uh, we have a committee board appointment mm -hmm. um, for Nancy Gilbert to the Board of Health through 6-30-2020. I think it's just a confirmation of the manager's appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in our packet there might even have been the uh, wait. We don't have a catheter. CAF. We do have a motion, number five. Yes, we do have a motion. Um, and so unless someone wants to add something else regarding this particular uh, appointment. I, I just want to say that we had two really excellent candidates for this position and um, I've talked with the other person that um, I'm not recommending, who, but have talked with her and she's very eager to serve in some capacity for the town, um, if not on the Board of Health, then something else. And so it's just, um, I think Ms. Kruger and I both felt it's just remarkable in this community how many talented people are out there who are willing to provide their service to the town. Um, I will move to confirm the town manager's appointment of Nancy Gilbert to the Board of Health through June 30th, 2020. Second. And there's a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Um, Aye. So, thank you, and congratulations to Ms. Gilbert. So next, I believe we have remaining on our consent calendar one item, <laughs> <laughs> which is a special alcohol you know, license at the top of campus incorporated at UMass on 427. So, somewhere. It's in there somewhere. I have a question. Yes, please go right ahead. Um, I won't hold this up because it just needs to be done. But in future, it would be helpful if we would clarify. And I know this is just expecting people to fill things out, but I don't know what that means. I'm assuming that means outside. But when we say plaza area, and we don't usually license outside premises i mean that that's atypical for us they're usually within confined within walls i'm not saying it's a problem i would just like to be clearer when they apply in future as to whether or not they're doing something inside or outside i hope people enjoy the outdoor weather and do nice things and with one day licenses but um and that of course will be i see but do, do you see my point? I mean, yeah, I, don't, oh, I, I don't know what the plaza area is at the Fine Arts Center. I mean, right. I can guess, but. It's um, everything in front of the pond. Right. right. How, how far does it extend gets to be a bit? Because normally we think of things as being one of the ways you control the event is that it's within an actual building envelope, not wandering all over the place. And that's before graduation, so the students will still be here. And so we don't, we have open container laws. And we don't want to conflict with those. I, I'm confused. Right. So if staff slash Chief Livingstone could follow up with making sure we understand what they asked for. You can find for, out where it is. Can, that would be helpful. We can bring this back if you'd like. Do we want to take 
the motion or do we want to wait? I actually want to know if it's outside. If I can, if we can wait, because we can, um, because it's April 27th, I'm just not sure uh, precedent-wise. I mean, we might be totally fine with it. I'm just trying to understand, right. and draw us a picture or something. Right. I mean, what are you, are you talking about in the back where the pond is? Are you talking about in the front at the Hagus Mall? What are you talking about as the right. plaza? And it may be that right. there's an art exhibit, you know, because they right. put art right there right. on the outside. Or is it maybe there's an art some way? Yeah, how will they manage it? Right. people at, that are at that yeah. event versus somebody a walking around with close an, <laughs> with an <laughs> open <laughs> container? How will right. they manage it? So if we could have so that we'll, postponed, that would be really helpful. Because we won't have to, you know, we won't be forever away. Right. I mean, they're going to get it. Well, there's time and... <sighs> Yeah. that so I believe as far as particular items we did all the motions I think so. we did all the motions and so I believe we're now into um, the town manager okay mm. thank you um, let's see uh, first off I wanted to and, um, remind or tell you and you knew, know already that the school uh, district has taken proactive steps in addressing school safety issues in light of the recent um, shooting in Florida, and it was good for them. Uh, the president of the teacher of the uh, union, along with the superintendent, wrote a joint letter to all the staff uh, when they came back, offering assistance if there were any issues, and um, encouraged them to be sensitive in their conversations. Because obviously, in a place like that, there's going to be a lot of concern. And I think it was really smart for them to be proactive and um, be on top of this going in. And speaking of school safety, at the um, at the request of the school uh, committee, we will be placing an officer uh, at the uh, Crocker Farm School on Election Day. We can, in terms of they, the police department did a threat assessment. Um, and it's, uh, it's they felt like the other two locations where we have uh, polling locations were, could be uh, secured in a good way. And Crocker Farm was the one place where people had to walk through the school and that the, a uh, officer on site there at, um, would be useful. And that seemed to be, that's the request of the uh, principal and the, um, and the superintendent and the school committee, in fact. Um, and I'll put more of this in writing to you next time. Um, the assessors, if you recall, there's a, a, the opportunity to appeal your um, assessment. We had 38 residential appeals and 10 commercial appeals. Um, and th of the 10 commercial appeals, five for, were for large apartment complexes. And that was not a surprise to us uh, and because those, those values of those properties went up 28% based on the market. The um, 38 residential prop property appeals were about average. There's nothing unusual in, in that number. Uh, today, the North Amherst Library um, uh, project, the, um, the, the committee that we have uh, reviewing the, the um, proposals for that, not the proposals, but the um, architects who want to do the work, they initially narrowed the group down from five to three, and then they interviewed three uh, of the groups today, and I'm be looking at that at their sort of assessment of those three um, architectural firms uh, shortly, and also along those same lines, the um, food security social services uh, RFP went out. We received two proposals back, and we'll be reviewing those as well. Uh, we have a small group. Uh, I didn't write down. Uh, it's uh, uh, Nate Malloy, Julie Fetterman, and Marta. Uh, from the school, uh, yes, from the schools who are on the review committee for that. Um, the um, we received notice today from the Amherst Housing Authority of the vacancy that you're all well aware of, unfortunately, and so we have. Um, I'm sure, if it wound up on your desk or not, but yes, yes okay, so you do. Uh, so we received it today. Um, And we sort of put together, since this ha did happen fairly recently, we sort of mimicked what we did in the past. So something for you to look at. Um, we picked a date of uh, April 2nd uh, for the um, 
if, if that you, but we can, I think what, what I'd suggest is that we look at this at your agenda setting meeting tomorrow morning at 10 when we talk about this to see how that fits in on our general calendar, uh, if that's the right date to have this joint meeting with them or not. Uh, so that'll be tomorrow, but just to, we're sort of lining that up. Um, the um, this election between where you and the housing authority come together there to elect a new person will just given the time frame will happen after the annual election and it was too late to put it on the actual election so that's why we will be doing it this this way um, the I want to update you on health insurance um, we continue to work with our insurance advisory committee uh, which is made up of 14 people, which includes representatives from retire the municipal retirees, the school, the teacher retirees, and then every collective bargaining unit in the town and the school, and includes uh, representative from the town of Pelham as well, because we provide health insurance to the regional school districts, to the elementary schools, to Pelham, and to the municipal employees. Uh, we continue to work with this group. Um, in a very cooperative way um, and trying to get to a, an agreement where everybody feels like it's um, a, a good solution going forward. The goal is to achieve a level of uh, um, predictability going forward in the next two or three years. Um, there are some complicating um, collective bargaining issues that we cannot address at the table. Uh, but people have certain rights under their collective bargaining agreement. So <coughs> we will continue to work this. At a certain point, we may have to bring uh, additional um, recommendations to you and to the regional school committee. But at this point, we're really looking forward to a meeting on March 6 uh, as we continue to work on this. And people have been very um, willing and cooperative. It's been really a good process. Uh, but the clock is ticking. And so we need to make decisions because once we look at July 1, we have to start taking, uh, we, we start, to, we implement it on June 1, a month in advance of it, and then we have to give people adequate time uh, to choose the plan that they want to be on, and also and to educate people about the options available to them, and also to give Blue Cross time to enroll people so everybody has a card in their pocket when, when, the, when the new year begins. So that's the goal, um, and we're putting a lot of time into this and um, looking at lots of different options as people request us to look at different options we continue to do that so that's moving forward you'll hear more about that every week probably um, we were fortunate to receive a technical assistance grant from the uh, district local technical assistance from the Pioneer Valley Planning Association um, let's see if I here um, Yes, and um, so what we requested was uh, to do a bike and pedestrian network plan and to map out where our um, sidewalks and bike paths are, and so PVPA will PVTA PVPA here we got it PVPC PV, PVPC Commission <laughs> I get Commission. one of them Commission um, just we'll, throw some letters out there um, will be doing this work for us. Uh, and there's a small 5% match, which we will match with an in-kind services. And so I'm excited about this because um, they'll look at our current planning documents, um, re review all of our street and uh, bike plans, and then help us sort of conceptualize how we can make sure all these things are able to connect. And this is, I think, one of the things that the um, TAC has been involved with. So this will really su support directly their work. Um, and then, um, and so the, the only, so, so that's, that's what I'm excited about that. We just received notice of that. Um, What's the dollar? You know, they don't. It's okay if you don't know. Uh, $20,000. Hmm. It's, it's good. In services, yeah. Yes. We have, we have a $1,000 right, right. match. Right. Um, then the other thing that, that uh, has come up, I, I can't, I just honestly can't remember if we talked about it here, was the um, idea of having signs of, of saying vote today um, 
um, at our polling locations and other places in town. So the League of Women Voters have an initiative to put their signs up, which um, have their logo on it. Uh, I was hesitant to encourage that, uh, even though that's it's a great idea because they want to have these signs out to encourage people to vote. Um, I didn't want to do anything that was different this year to feel like any, anybody was influencing anything. So I want to bring it to your attention, to your to see what you thought we could bring pretty quickly turn around have some signs made up that say vote today uh, town sponsored signs that um, would be placed at certain locations I wanted to get your read on things first before I did that if you thought that um, it was something that you uh, many communities do this already they put these signs out and um, my sense is that it you know we could say vote Tuesday on it as well, and you put it out the Wednesday before the election. I think sometimes when you put signs out to say vote, your your vote matters or something, people sort of forget about it. The idea is that let people know to vote on this day because this is the day to vote or to vote coming Tuesday. Um, so I just wanted to get your read on it. If if so, we I'd pull together everything. Um, now it's fine. Oh, so they just taped my vote. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stick around, I guess I'm in the mood, but um, I, I'm not, I, th I think um, getting people to vote is great, and I'm not sure how that would be influencing a side in a particular, you know, because yeah. um, you don't know who you're getting to vote, who might have just forgotten. It might be a good thing to start now and do forward it's not because a particular you know content is up right now so I, I, I think always um, you know trying to encourage voting participation is a good thing and that also kind of comports with our values and we've tried to do that we haven't had this particular request before but um, I don't know I, I'm trying to see what would be wrong with doing it Miss Brewer looks like she might know. <laughs> <laughs> Does that look like? That's very funny. Um, and, and, and the reason I bring it up today is because the time is Oh, is yeah. Right. Right. You know, if we're going to do it, we need to uh, yeah, do we it need to let them know. So we all know rules about public resources, blah, 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 and all those details. And like you say, other towns do, well, other towns do things and get in trouble too. So, but this isn't one of those things. Right. This appears to be one of those things that is clear cut that you're allowed to say. You cannot say, remember to go vote on question one, vote sponsored by the town of Amherst. Um, but, <laughs> exactly. Don't forget, there's a race for town meeting members today. Um, but we can certainly say vote. I like the idea of saying vote Tuesday because if you put it up too far ahead of time and then people get confused mm -hmm. and you, you know, you drive through Hadley as we all do at some point or another. And since there's only like a place to vote right there at the intersection, it says vote today on a sandwich board. And it's like, oh, bet that's really useful to people to be reminded of people that on really their way forget. to work the night yeah. before really and, and the next, the next morning. So. I think it sounds incredibly useful. I think it is incredibly simple. It's vote Tuesday. And I can't think of anything else that needs to go on the sign. But, and I do think it should be separate from the league as an active league member. First of all, we depend too much on the league to take care of us for things like this. Also, they don't always know where all the signs are. And so instead of collecting them off people's porches, they can put theirs up too because theirs are nonpartisan as well. And the more the merrier. But um, if they just say, what else would they say? Vote Tuesday? Uh, town election Tuesday or something I like that. I think they should just say vote Tuesday yeah, because most more primaries more. and most general elections are on Tuesdays. Yeah, and our town election is almost always on Tuesdays. Again, yeah. almost always. Could, could we have some identifier like the town logo or something so you know that it was put up by the town? Right. It wasn't just you know a student group who decided to do this thing. Not the flag. <laughs> I refuse to do it. Oh, no, I didn't, no. no town logo, right. Logo. Um, the letterhead type logo. Not the logo. town flag. I, I, <laughs> right, not the town flag, not the American not flag, anything. not the Commonwealth's flag, but the letterhead mm -hmm. logo. Mm -hmm. For now. When no one knows what it, the symbol is. Exactly, but they recognize it as being the town official, of Amherst logo. Official. Yes. Well, that also, the other thing is by being identified as the town's, there are things we as the town can do as far as putting things in the public way that are distinct from what 
others can do relative mm -hmm. to the public way mm -hmm. and re relative to what might be construed as a political sign, which it isn't. It's a, a sign to encourage people to vote. Civic engagement sign. So you're right. planning to put one in the common, is what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> because we don't let anybody else do that. And No, no, I'm just saying that, you know. But you, you have a point. The right of way is like next to the street is part, your, your right of way extends. Anyway, but they're not supposed to. So right. could we also just say that it would be the manager's discretion about locations? Yes. Oh, obviously, obviously, I don't want to. I know. Personally, get there, but I'm just. If perchance it were in a location that. I think it's a good idea. But. And and after we do it once, we'll get a good idea of how many of them disappear, mm -hmm. where people commented on them, and then right. we'll see how it works for the next time, and then we'll be ready for the primary in September. So. Yeah. That sounds great because I don't. I wouldn't want it to just make it sound like it's just a town of Amherst election. But I like the idea of having the logo, so it's clear that we produced it. But it's for any Tuesday vote, pretty right. much. Mm -hmm. It could be really good for the September primary because that's out of Nobody. cycle. So right. at mm -hmm. that point, we might yeah. the day after Labor Day. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. Okay, great. That's all I have. That was all you had. Yep. All right. Um, so now we're on to uh, member reports. Members. It's kind of a quiet week with the school vacation. A lot of meetings mm -hmm. didn't happen because we, sure. as a town, generally don't meet during those time periods. So um, I've kind of given you a little bit of report myself. The Ag Commission did, did meet, um, and uh, they had some guests, and they asked them if they might be willing to serve. So there may be some uh, CAF uh, applications coming our way. Um, relative to that uh, and and they they did you know uh, support the idea of of the uh, agricultural use meters and and uh, and I think they and you know we had to speak broadly about any sort of you know, sort of financial question which we spent a fair amount of time talking about tonight but you know they didn't have much for particulars on that but it, we're obviously supportive of that as well because it helps um, promote and encourage agriculture in town um, I can't remember what else they discussed at their meeting. Uh, they got a report from the the farmers market manager about the coming year, um, which we got. So, <laughs> déjà vu. Um, and I think that's it for me as far as member reports. So I don't know if I'm trying to recall if there's anything else. But if anyone else has anything, yes. Can I ask you a question. Did AgCom decide to do anything about either decreasing their quorum, potentially decreasing the oh. quorum, as opposed to decreasing their measure, their membership, or so, uh, or one or the other? Yes, they had conversations about that, um, and so I think that their um, staff liaison is uh, going to look into pursuing changes to to membership counts. So one thing I found in looking up the state law relative to ag commissions is that by state law, seven is the maximum, although we have nine. I don't know if we did like a home rule petition to go to nine, but so there were also some, some potential uh, refinement of the language of who's eligible to be on uh, the ag com that they were wanting to explore, although again, state law has some things to say about that. So uh, I think there's some due diligence going on in the background relative to that, but they were open to the idea of reducing membership a little bit and then potentially they, they were thinking about broadening who might be allowed on um, and so putting both of those into some, some motions for town meeting. So we will likely see that come forward. Um, but there's some, like I said, some due diligence that's being chased at this moment about how that would work. Yes. Just to belabor the point a little bit to really be clear on what was the previous town meeting action that got us to where we are because we started out with a farm committee before agriculture because we're always so forward thinking before the state came up with that as I recollect we had our own farm committee which we then turned into an official ag commission and so that may be part of why we were able to do what we did or we just did it anyway because we're Amherst and that's what we do is but to know what that wording was in addition to what the state wording is <laughs> right so that we capture the spirit of both in in order to accomplish yes. our goals yeah that would be helpful because i know that people don't always like looking up those old pieces of paper but that's helpful. right yeah so what we have explicitly voted by virtue of town meeting versus yes and how that compares to and puts us in conflict with or not the state law around that 
we have that's part of what regardless if there's a conflict we'll have to resolve that at a minimum but also um, if there's ways we can fit those together neatly because there's actually three pieces at least the mass general law right the annual town meeting action that whatever the most recent one was that turned us into an agcom there probably wasn't another one after that but i can't swear to it and then what our charge document says because sometimes those three things are not as clearly right. related as you might imagine so so we will chase all those something for something fun for annual town meeting does anyone else Ms. Kruger? i'm going to leave any uh adult use marijuana updates for Ms. Brewer, but um, we did have a um, campus community coalition meeting last week and they passed out this flyer and there were extras and so I brought a bunch back and asked that it be in the packet and then amazingly we got it on our desk tonight and we got it in our packet. The one in the packet was stapled to something else that really kind of had to do with the CCC, but it had nothing to do with this, so I don't know why that happened. And um, I wanted you to know that our very own Miss Brewer is one of the um, fourth diamond down um, local police chiefs and municipal leaders, and I have um, emailed Eric Beal and said, why don't you say the names of those local officials? But he did not. I guess that wasn't as exciting as the other people but they he knows who they are and he could have listed them but um you know and, and maybe miss brewer want to say some more but this is something that the municipal strategies subcommittee of our ccc has been talking about and heather warner from spiffy and eric peel works at umass um as a you know his exact title but a community uh liaison position um, I've been wor <clears throat> working on, so just so people who are listening to me ramble on, the Alcohol Retailers and Municipal Leaders Forum, Monday, March 19th, 2018. It's at, it starts at 9 and goes to 11.30. It's, in, it's at old, the Old Chapel at UMass, which always makes it even nicer. Um, and registration is free, which you can do by email or phone. So I gather this is probably in, in our electronic packet now. So I wanted to just let you know why that, that was in there. Um, I also went to a Transportation Advisory Committee meeting last week, and that was informative. They are kind of working away, and it seems like they're getting clearer on some of their priorities. They were excited about the District Local Technical Assistance Grant that Mr. Bachman just told us about. Um, I also went to a zoning subcommittee meeting last week and got kind of a preview of what um, they're working on for zoning articles that we'll be reviewing when we um, do our article review for Springtown meeting. I'm not going to go into them, what they are, unless you want to know. And um, Mr. Steinberg and I have been working on a, uh, with the, Mr. Bockelman, um, on a re potential revision to the um, zero energy bylaw and working with some of the petitioners and i think that's been productive it's it's actually been a fair amount of work because we're on a pretty accelerated timeline but um so far we continue to collaborate productively so um i think that's what i've been doing and it was nice to have a somewhat quieter week last week um because a lot of people weren't around and um, that's all I can think of. So that's my report. Okay, thank you. Ms. Brewer? I have a question, actually. I'm really sorry. What did you say was the last thing you were still working with Mr. Steinberg on? I totally zero missed energy. the topic. The zero energy. Thank you. You just like blanked out when you got to that one. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Thank which you. is not well because i knew we also got a piece of paper on our desk tonight which was a memo about right. oh i forgot that process. that's amazing oh i'm thank so you that's why i was thinking no you were actually i mentioned and i that and meant I'm to say it, it but it wasn't in my bulleted list to keep me from forgetting things so um i thought it was going to be letterhead oh, but sorry. not and with the draft taken off but it might as well because we're not it's not on our agenda for tonight but we wanted you to have this something mr steinberg and i 
work done and had Mr. Bachelman review. So we had been asked if there was a way to simplify the number of interviews that we were doing for committee members. And this is a set of ideas. It kind of relates to like the AGCOM appointment. And if there were some appropriately interested members, um, potentially just the um, select board liaison could do an interview or a phone interview or maybe in conjunction with the chair and we wouldn't need to do the full team thing um, and it gives some per, some criteria for how to make that decision so I'd, I'd suggest you look at this and then it will be so we'll formalize it and put it in the back and put it as an agenda item agenda item week. yeah okay. just um, to get your thoughts otherwise I can't really talk about it um, Thank you for reminding me, Ms. Brewer, since I right. um, meant to tell you about it. So yeah. I'm going to suggest when I'm at agenda setting tomorrow that um, we do take the word draft off of it because it's not a <laughs> oh, draft. No, it's a mistake. It's not a draft. <laughs> you propose. It's not no, the new it's proposal. Not, no. It's just a report you, you, right now. Yeah, you weren't supposed to see and it naked also, like this. It says attached, and there wasn't an attachment. Yeah, so we'll do we that have that available? Okay. They won't, so will that we'll be available? That. Okay. Uh, that's what I'm trying to get at. Probably not. Since we never see at agenda setting what we're actually putting in the packet, only speak of what we're putting in the packet. I was just trying to understand that that's so something we, we yeah. Um, probably not. We would that. we would expect to have available an attachment because it says there's an attachment. No, we're going to change we're going to update the language. Uh, so I'll just not to be mysterious. We, we tried to do a cut of like some committees that would have like the full tilt and some not just to help decide and it, it didn't seem appropriate to actually attach that kind of a list right now well and so that so will you should bring not it to be, a meeting no I think not okay I think the word attached will be removed so let's take out the words as attached and take out the word draft and but still yes. republish it as February 8th as a memo it's just yeah, a memo. Or you could update it from, t you know, whatever date. So I think the manager's office will turn this into Mr. Bachelman knows the change. So um, I think it's better to leave the, the list a little fluid. Um, I just don't want people looking for an I know. No, you, no, you <laughs> found it. I said it's wrong. We're going to take it out. <laughs> this was a prior iteration. It's all good. It's all Even good. though that was still in there. Yep. You take away the attachment and you forget to take the word out. That's right. Thank you for remembering. Thank you. Item. So. Other reports? Ooh. All no. Ms. Brewer, yes. So, um, yes, as I am now one of the famous municipal leaders. <laughs> See, the nice thing about that is just like pretty much anybody can show, show up. up. And they'd be or fine. you can decide not to go. Right? Um, and, and that works out really nicely. But the reason I was invited was because I served on one of the many working groups that was under Treasurer Deb Goldberg's alcohol task force. And when I last looked, when Mr. Beal confirmed this with me a couple weeks ago, um, the final recommendations of the various working groups were gathered together by the people on the actual task force and submitted to Ms. Goldberg, but that's never been uploaded to the website as far as I can tell, only an intermediate report from last August. So yes, the Commonwealth at work. And so, uh, you know, I can't really tell you to go look at it because I don't know what it says myself. So. Um, yeah, so that was an interesting experience, and so I'll be interested to hear because there are other local people that also were on separate working groups who are going to be associated with this meeting as well. So um, in addition to all the other thousands of things we'll talk about. The other thing is because it was so nice of Ms. Kruger to, to, to let me speak of marijuana because it's such our favorite topic. Um, in our packet, there was the email, which is not particularly beautiful, but um, went to the Cannabis Control Commission at six minutes before their deadline on the 15th, because we'd previously written to them. We have testified in front we of them numerous them times. <laughs> they know us by now, but we wanted to follow up on some items. And I am incredibly pleased to report that as of today, um, due to, I'm sure, Amherst memo, as opposed to all the state agencies that came down on them, including Governor Baker's office themselves, um, that they are postponing action on delivery only services and postponing action on um, 
cafes, basically, social consumption uh, locations, because it was just getting way too, which is, as I said in this email, it was just getting too complicated. And that doesn't mean they're putting it off forever. And I was actually quite encouraged to see that the gist of the conversation seems to be that in order to meet the social justice issues that we all voted for this thing for in the first place, that they would potentially be looking at rolling it out with a, you know, a special group. No pun. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> to give people priority, as was intended when they started writing the regulations for those particular things, and that, for example, a craft cooperative would potentially be allowed a delivery service as opposed, once they do start doing it, as opposed to just delivery. anybody can set up shop as a delivery service. So it seems like the best of both worlds. It's pushed off a little bit, and it's put into the giving special precedence to communities that are specially impacted. Now, they haven't quite clarified what that's going to look like in terms of who qualifies under those rules, but that's obviously something they're working on in the regs, and then they're going to have to come up with more details on. But it's one of those things that I do feel like we're actually, we are making an impact, even if it turns out that was perhaps not us that convinced them to make that decision, but we certainly were the people that, by us going and, and talking to them about the fact that we're in support of doing this, we're not anti, we're just trying to figure out how to do it well, and I think that that's making something of an impression. Just remind us the deadline they're up against, and which I think they're going to, they say they're going to. Yeah, they say they're going to meet the March, well, they say they're going to issue a March 9th, because March 15th is their deadline. And they're meeting basically all this week to try and to try and sort out their details. So that will be very interesting to see how those details do, in fact, come up. And then we do have items that we know are going to be mostly zoning items, as far as I can tell at this point, associated with our trying to predict the future, associated with what they're doing. But then hopefully we can word, there have already been a couple of hearings on potential zoning amendments before town meeting that will probably be more and they will hopefully be worded well enough that depending on what the regs actually say before we sign the warrant <laughs> the words can all magically come together to uh, make sense about what we're trying to proactively do to make sure this is implemented in a safe and reasonable way in Amherst so we have continuing things that are going to be happening associated with that there will be additional warrant articles associated with that enough. That's it. Julie, Mr. Chair, that reminds me. What happened? We had that discussion about the request to come before us by... That'll come up at agenda setting. Okay. All right. Just not forget about it. Anything, Mr. Wolf? I, I do have one other thing um, that I definitely want to mention. That Wednesday, February 28th, at 7 p.m. in this room, yep. the Amherst Center Recreation Working Group is wanting public participation in a process regarding the master plan for um, fields, recreation fields in the center of town. Hmm. So we want anybody and everybody that has any interest in those to come down and offer their opinions. The folks at Weston and Sampson who we've hired to help us out with that are going to be here to talk about those things. And so we're trying to uh, get the word out and get folks to come and talk about that. This reminds me, just relative to the grant that you were just talking mm -hmm. about, um, and not that they're completely overlapping, but there are some when you start talking about sidewalks and you start talking about recreation in downtown and thinking about how those can be complementary processes, just that I would encourage the PVPC people to have some conversations perhaps with the Weston and Sampson folks just mm -hmm. to coordinate around, because there could be, you know, sort of uh, activity paths that involve streets mm -hmm. and so that in sidewalks that exist in town so do you have um, PVTA hearings PVTA hearings are coming up uh, they are let's see next week oh okay so early March and they're on yes. the website I know I just like, on the website I the sixth you... is one mm -hmm. and then the seventh or eighth I forget it's almost always back talk about PPTA so I know I, like I that we haven't met and I did thank you for reminding me of that though um, because those those uh, sessions where they they want co public comment again uh, relative to changes to both routes and rates uh, mm -hmm. are, are coming uh, there'll be an on-campus meeting one day and a, a meeting at the bank center the other day um, and again, we want to encourage people to come and, and uh, hear about what's being discussed and, and offer 
their uh, feedback to to PVTA and uh, around those those would, issues. Would you be able to go to those or one of those? I believe so. Uh, I'm going to double check my calendar, but I believe I won't be able to go to the one on campus. I don't think because I think it's a little more in the middle of the day. Um, but the one that oh, is um, at the bank center, I believe I can make. I believe I've kind of set aside time to do that. So I will try to attend and, I know and hear people firsthand. At, at the TAC meeting, we're very interested in those dates. Yes. So I appreciate staff making sure that got up on the website. Yeah. That was helpful. So I think that's the last of what I had now that I've forgotten those things. But. I, so just to double check, the fields meeting, for some reason I had in my calendar for Tuesday. So it's Wednesday night. It's okay, the 28th. Good. good just making sure excellent and of course it's posted 20. as a meeting of the this center week. working group so it's fun no, it that's is this week that is yes. this week yes. that is, is this day week. after tomorrow and i have a question Soon. about the mma legislative breakfast yes. palmer really that's as close as we can get this year it looks like so Gardner. <laughs> that's even further so um i mean unless there's some i ignored that email what what was they have the, a nice candy shop. the first one's friday the first a bit, one of the very first ones is Friday morning. Palmer seems to be the it, technically it, closest. It's Gardner Friday. is another option to go to the and you know the spring and fall legislative breakfast where they give us the update as to what's going on. Um, it's also going to be one of our last opportunities to see some of our reps potentially, given how many retirements are happening, depending on who's uh, showing up for that particular issue, but uh, for that particular event, because they always run a couple of them on each of those days, and so I'm not sure who's going to Palmer. But are any of us going to Palmer? Am I going to Palmer all by myself? I will go to Palmer all by myself on Friday if I have to, but uh, let me know if anybody else wants to Friday, go. But, but that's a little, I know that they, other people have to hike when it's here or in Northampton or Belchertown, but somehow that just feels further than usual um, because it's not within our sort of four towns or exact neighbors. My calendar said it says it's the Indian holiday of Holly. I <laughs> might be busy <laughs> right. throwing colored powders around. Right. And it's also the day, the, that afternoon is when you and I are going right, to, to the that event school. for Dial Self for the Youth Engagement Summit thing. Yeah. Um, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Because it'll be high school kids. And exactly. Be they'll be interesting, I'm sure. Um, I haven't decided. Okay. Well, let me know because yeah. I'm planning to go. I'm planning to take the day off work because between the beginning and the end, I don't have it's not another much option. So Lunch in the middle. That's really what happens. Go, you're going anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I won't drive. Maybe I'll take the bus. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other reports or comments at all? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn move that we adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor? Welcome home, sir. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Absolutely you're perfect. On your way. You're on your I am on my way. <laughs> All sir, those in favor, you, you please well say aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. We're adjourned at 9.51. I was trying to check <laughs> the time and I held it down too long. Has it ever said that before? I don't think it's ever said that before. So whatever.